All of you come from far and wide to come and discuss the state of medical innovation in India and to promote organic, low cost, but high impact medical innovation. Uh, Dr. Lele, it's an absolute honor having you here. Mr. Kutani sir, and all our esteemed guests from, uh, from our station. A quick housekeeping note, your folders contain the biographies of the individuals who are here. We are actually we awaiting Dr. Vita Raghavan on Skype. He was unable to make it here because he was back from the uh, 3M's delegation from Canada. So he won't be able to be here in, uh, physically, but he wanted to address the gathering on Skype. So we're just waiting for that call to come through on our system. Until then, I'd just like to give a brief introduction about what we're doing here. So the Observer Research Foundation is a non-partisan public policy think tank. We are forerunners in the space of urban governance, civic issues, public health, many of you. Public health is something that is very, very close to the work that we do here, and innovation is something that is very close to what I do. And at the end of the day, we realized that Sharida Kirtane, who is actually conceptualized and thought of this whole thing right down from the banner to the people who've come here, that India has some of the best minds in the world. There's no doubts about that, and your testament to the fact. India also has some of the most easily available funding avenues if needed. India also has the largest market. And as Dr. Jha was telling me yesterday, he asked me a trick question. Dr. Prashant Jha from Stanford India Biodesign asked me yesterday, is India a developing country, a developed country, or an underdeveloped country? And I said, it's a developing country. And he quickly told me, you're wrong. We're all three. And that's profound. We have markets for the drugs that we help patent, we help create, but then we help also ship abroad and come back at three times the price. We have markets for the innovations that are created at our labs by our minds, and then again they get sent abroad and come back at eight times the price. Vineet from GE was just telling me this morning that, uh, and sorry, I might be paraphrasing you, Vineet, that India contributes 30 million to GE's uh, the term you used was super value products, products that have been built just keeping the Indian market in mind, the portable ECG, the CT that they've constructed here, all done by GE scientists and engineers in Bangalore and deployed in India. But that just makes up 10% of GE's sales in India. The rest of the traditional sales all happen from the traditional market at 300 million. And that is just a drop in the ocean for the global market. So we are clearly lacking somewhere. And that's why we've got you all here today to talk about what we can do better. How can we not just make an India, but also think in India, create an India, and at the end of the day, execute in India. So a warm welcome to all of you. The first session after the video chat will commence on innovator experiences. We have some excellent companies in the domain of healthcare and innovation and we'll have them present their ideas, their products, but more importantly, their personal story. The story that is mostly lost out in the product and the pitch. How did they get there? How did the system help them? Or in some cases, how did the system impede their progress? And yet, they managed to make it. So I'm going to go ahead and call in Dr. Vijay Raghavan now. And uh, after that, we'll start the first session. Thank you. The challenge uh, we have before us is how does one in the biomedical sector translate the make in India uh, slogan to reality? Is this something feasible at all? Uh, because if you look at two major issues at hand, um, one is the size of the biomedical industry, the biotech industry, the agribiotech industry all over the world. Now, India's share is a few percent of that whole industry. Uh, and is it at, at all reasonable to expect us to make any significant rapid progress in making a dent on that industry and having something much larger, say 10, 15, 20 percent of the industry in any reasonable time? Is that feasible? On the face of it, the answer is no. I mean, Biotech is not like IT. You can't, uh, you know, bootstrap rapidly. It requires enormous infrastructure, a regulatory framework which is user-friendly, 
talented people at every level uh, and leadership and so on and so forth. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. Then in that background of that multi-billion dollar industry, you have startups and other things happening. So logically, that seems to be a dead end. At the other side, you have our problems. If you look at any map of the world, uh, a map of, you know, Indians are of the wrong color, whether it's tuberculosis, malaria, filariasis, uh, you know, corruption, any indices, if you look at a colored map of the world, India seems to be of the wrong color. So how do we change our color? Now, this is a slight problem. And this, again, seems completely impossible, right? Because we constantly talk about changing India. We don't, and that looks as an impossible task. And perhaps both in terms of big industry uh, and where we want to be uh, in, in, in certain domain areas and in terms of changing India's, uh, India, we should start looking at components which are tractable to change rather than look at the big picture and bemoan what is happening. Now, this is a uh, problem, this logical problem of there not being any hope is a problem which India has combated successfully in the past. For example, if you look at India at 1947, there's absolutely no reason to suggest that post-colonial countries such as India should invest in science and technology, right? The view would be that you need to invest, first of all, in primary education, primary health, uh, literacy, uh, social welfare, maternal health, and so on. Sort all of that out, take a few decades, and then invest in high-tech science and technology. India did not do that, uh, and many post-colonial countries actually did that. And India is all said and done better off for that. There was no logical reason for many of our pre-colonial, um, uh, uh, for our colonial period scientists to start institutions, whether it's Baba or Meghnath Saha or uh, Mahalanobis. These people actually started institutions in addition to doing their science. That had a huge impact. But there was another factor in the impact of science at that time. So these people, first of all, defined logic, defied logic and started institutions. But the government's too was also at that time insensitive to logic. For a variety of reasons, not driven by these scientists, the government started higher educational institutions and places such as the IITs, right? Once they were started, there was a bemoaning at that time, as there is now, that there is no leadership, there, is no, there are no faculty members, where will you find people, and so on and so forth. And things happen. And I'll, I'll, add, I'll come back to this point a little later about how things happen. So we have lessons that defying logic and trying out the impossible is not such a bad thing. Because the realm of possibility is defined by what we know rationally, but we don't factor in the change that can come about by trying difficult things. Now, it's all very well to say try difficult things. The question is, how does one actually get along to doing that? And what should our relative priorities be? And I'll address very briefly three different aspects on this. One is the value of basic science in a Make in India venture. The second is the interface between basic science and industry and how we can rapidly create that. And the third is to have actually having a global impact rapidly. I use rapidly in each of these situations because supposedly we have a huge demographic dividend. And as we all know, each of us ages one year in one year's time. And this demographic dividend is likely to become a demographic disaster very soon unless we address this rapidly part. Now, rapidly is a problem because doing anything on scale rapidly means that you compromise on quality. So in each of these aspects, whether it's basic science, the interface, or on the impact, we need to match speed with quality. And that's really very, very difficult. It's like asking a sprinter to tie her shoelaces while she's running, right? It's possible, but it's very, very difficult. It's possible with much assistance, and I'll come to that. So let's take each of these components. Let's take basic science. There is a tendency the world over, and this tendency is amplified 
in desperate contexts such as India, in poor countries, that what purpose does basic science serve? You merely, quote unquote, merely publish papers. That has no real value. Get on and do something useful, right? Now, there is no question that doing something useful is important, but not doing something useless can be dangerous. Basic science appears useless, but it is exactly that kind of useless adventure which lays the foundation of audacity and discovery from which rapid change can come from. So whether we are in industry or whether we are in basic science, we or whether we are in, you know, in politics, we need to communicate the value of intellectual adventure. That can be truly transformative. And if you look at how science has been transformed in the biotech sector over the last decade, each and every major transformation the last few decades have come from this crazy intellectual adventures from small places, you know, whether over, over several decades, whether it's a discovery of the structure of DNA, the polymerase chain reaction, the discovery of RNAi, of green fluorescent protein as a marker, of imaging techniques. All of these have not come for multi-billion dollar investments, but small components of those investments with adventure and daring. And we need to communicate that. We need to communicate that in our context, because you can always say, oh, well, basic science is very important. Why don't we let the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation in USA and the UK and Europe do basic science? It's all public knowledge. We can take that public knowledge and make applications. Applications in a make in India biotech context do not work that way. You cannot you know, be a top class applied scientist without being a top class basic scientist. And you can't be a top class basic scientist without doing basic science. But more fundamentally, there are opportunities in basic science in the Indian context, which big ships in the West are unable to grasp. For example, the prime minister was recently in France and we signed a memorandum of understanding on marine biology. India's marine boundaries, as it were, stretch from the Andamans to mainland India to Lakshadweep, right? It has got great potential for both science, diplomacy, and biotech. Have we grasped that as a nation? No. Is that an opportunity now? Yes. Can we go into high-tech biology, basic and applied? Yes. How can we do that rapidly? By international collaboration with the best. International science in these areas is hamstrung by not being able to be adventurous in these kinds of areas because these are big ships which have charted out specific courses. When India opens up these kinds of adventures, we can develop a high quality hub in which the best of the world scientists are attracted to and we rapidly can hit an area such as marine biotech. I'm just using that as an example, by the way, of how things can rapidly change. From that hub, we can actually have multiple spokes because the hub is used as a training ground where adventures in marine biology and biotech can be used both as training a large number of people and going on to these kinds of areas. Then this can be linked up with industry in new kinds of ways. What is true of marine biotech is true for microbiology. It's true for the you know, bugs in our gut and characterizing them. It's true for human immunology. These are all unexplored areas at the interface of basic science and application, and we need to grasp those. One way we have taken this forward is, you know, for example, we've just funded a major program twinning centers in the Northeast with labs in the rest of India to study what is broadly called chemical ecology. Chemical ecology studies the chemistry of insects, plants, their interactions, toxins which are made by plants or insects and so on and so forth. And all these have extraordinarily exciting basic biology, but also ex extraordinarily exciting applications in drug discovery, pain treatment, cancer biology, and so on. It is these kind of new areas, if India embarks on, that we can very rapidly make headway globally. Remember, we must all both admire and fear the exponential. If we embark on new areas and double every year, very soon will be a major power in these kinds of areas. So choosing areas carefully, marine biology, chemical ecology, 
human biology can hit us well in having basic science foundation as well as you know having impact another area by the way is an interface between computer science and biology handling of big data where because young people do extraordinarily well in these areas within five years india can populate this domain nationally and globally with top quality people so this foundation is something we are trying to push in a big way in partnership with the uh, university sector in the ministry of human resource development in our national labs uh, and elsewhere now we next come to the interface problem the interface problem is the area between basic science and application now this is a fundamental problem in our system and this needs to be addressed there are two aspects needed for success at this interface this the the you know desire for making for, for for startups is something which needs to be there in one's gut <clears throat> i was in iit bombay recently in the chemical engineering department for a seminar and i asked how many students were graduating that year it was something like 120 or something 170 maybe i don't remember the number and it turned out that an overwhelming majority nearly all of them were actually wanting to go into startups right very few were going abroad for their masters or, or phds and this is an inversion from what i knew of many years earlier so this was very impressive but then i interacted with graduate students and postdocs and faculty members almost no graduate students in the same institution in the same department actually go on to become entrepreneurs right some of the faculty consult so there's this entrepreneurial spirit driven by it which is there in the sector uh, which is uh, present amongst undergraduates but is uh, uh, but but this this presence is not seen in in uh, amongst the graduate students and faculty members so the challenge is how can we actually instill this kind of interface now this interface is something which we have pushed in certain kinds of areas and it's proven to be extraordinarily successful and again both national and international co um, collaborations one for example is uh, a collaboration in the bioenergy sector now biofuels can be very easily derided as being irrelevant in the era of crashing oil prices but having quality bioengineering in these kinds of areas can be extraordinarily valuable when we actually want to be able to use this in a variety of ways now what's happening here is something interesting so far in biology we've understood really well nature's engineering we've known how evolution takes place how dna translates into organisms and their structure and behavior and so on there's a lot to know but something else has dramatically happened again from basic science in the last few years today we have the ability to engineer nature in a manner which we never had ever ever before and this has happened in the last decade or so there are ways by which we can engineer entire genomes and entire pathways so in the energy sector for example at the institute for chemical technology where i think dr lele is uh, over there um, and and several others um, they actually are working on looking at new kinds of ways of bioenergy but that combined with whole genome engineering can be truly transformative now how can we create these kinds of interface areas on a large scale the problem is that we need two things to create these interfaces our faculty and our graduate students and postdocs need to have the same fire in the belly which we see in our undergraduates vis-a-vis -vis startups in the it sector so how can we create this in the biomed or biotech or agribiotech sector so there is no significant fire in the belly except in a few notable places ict bombay a few places you know in delhi in pune and bangalore but it doesn't have it hasn't scaled so we need to scale that up the second is we need to actually have facilitating mechanisms but these facilitating mechanisms are actually there in many ways for faculty members to start industry yet they actually they haven't do that in a large number the other aspect which is needed is an industry push for interaction 
Now, industry constantly complains that academia don't, don't interact as much as they need to, and academia doesn't have the fire in the belly in some situations. But what's happening is something rather interesting and exciting, which we should take note. And that is industry, adventurous industry, is not looking at academia just in India, but looking at academia all the world for these kinds of interactions. This has resulted in some notable areas, a ramping up of the quality of industry. This has stimulated Indian academia to interact. This has stimulated graduate students and postdocs to get jobs in industry. So I can connect a upward spiral, albeit the slope is small, of academia interactions with industry. The Department of Biotechnology has pushed incubators in several locations. These are in Bangalore, in, in the Delhi area, in the Mumbai area. And these interfacial incubators through the DBT's BIRAC are showing some signs of you know, action. There's a depressing point here, though. This is very exciting, and lots of nice things have happened, but they have happened, importantly, because this space was poorly occupied. And therefore, we should not rest on our laurels seeing the you know, excitement of the academia industry interface in these few locations. It just points to our not having occupied that space earlier. So the challenge is how to scale up. We can't scale up with the level of government investment which is there, yet investment which is from the public sector is necessary to scale up. How do we manage that? Unless we have models of banks coming in, banks in a manner similar to NABARD and the other banks coming in, to partner with government agencies such as BIRAC. BIRAC actually says, this particular interfacial interaction, this particular set of entrepreneurs are of the highest quality. Unless we have this quality also having uh, uh, you know, partnership internationally, uh, it will not succeed. And therefore, the bank can then you know, take this certification and go ahead and fund it. There are some small steps in these directions, but unless we bring in funding systems, this is not going to expand. The other big hurdle, which again is being grappled with, which I think will be resolved, is a regulatory hurdle. Whether it's devices or clinical trials or basic clinical research or agribiotic research, we have sort of spun ourselves into a cocoon of stasis. And that we have to get off. And this is a fundamental issue which industry, society, and academia should openly grapple with. We don't have the luxury of postponing decisions. Well, actually, we do. Those of us in this room in front of me, or myself over here, have the luxury of postponing decisions. Our children get vaccinated because we have the money to pay for vaccinations. Our children get nutrition because we have money to pay for any kind of food we want, or education, or everything else. But India is a salt and pepper mix of a France and Germany on one hand and a sub-Saharan Africa on the other. And this France and Germany mix has the luxury of endlessly debating whether GMO is good or not, whether a vaccine is good or not. But 100,000 kids die of a vaccine-preventable disease every year. We don't mind postponing a decision for five years or 10 years. India is what, one of the poorest records in the world in introducing new vaccines which are available. That has been broken recently this year, and we have introduced several vaccines. But we need the courage to take hard, complex decisions. These are not going to be simple decisions. These are not going to be decisions which is right or wrong. It's going to be a mixture of, you know, uh, in the gray zone. But it has to be overwhelmingly positive, and we go ahead and do it. And there are going to be problems, and we need to grapple with that. The only aircraft which is 100% safe is one which just doesn't take off, right? And we can't build those kinds of aircraft, completely safe aircraft. And unless, as decision makers in the room, we take complex decisions, we are going to be in gridlock. No amount of talking in a hard sector like Make in India is going to be trusted. So regulation is one aspect, and uh, capital is the other. Capital is available. Capital must be, you know, have the uh, flexibility of seeing that uh, quality startups are available that the government in partnership with uh, academia can actually certify quite well. But the regulatory landscape needs to be better, and we're trying really hard to do that. Things have improved a bit, 
but there's a long, long way to go over that. Right? So that's one aspect. Now, finally, the third aspect, how can one have impact to scale in these kinds of sectors relatively rapidly? Now, the problem is India's biotech sector right now is uh, about $4.3 billion market in fiscal year 2013. And it's got an annualized growth rate of about 10.6 from 2008 to 2013. Can we boost the biotech industry to 100 billion by 2025 and achieve global leadership in some high potential areas? For example, biosimilars, medtech, bioagri, biopharma, big data, analytics, genomics, chemical ecology, and marine biology. I mentioned some of these areas, and the short answer is yes, we can do that. The question is, how can we do that? We need to have goals which are reasonable goals, which actually connect to the huge size and volume and needs of our society. We are looking too much in the biotech industry in a manner analogous to the IT industry of markets globally. That is important, that is necessary, that has been extraordinarily successful in vaccines, generics, and biosimilars. But those areas, the carpet will be pulled from under our feet very soon. Science and technology is changing extraordinarily rapidly. And if big industry from India is to be competitive in these areas, it needs to be linked to science globally, including our basic science, but importantly to our society. The question is, how can that be done? We need to get into areas of drug discovery and vaccines and treatment and devices and diagnostics in our huge context. That is something which is practical. I always give the example uh, without any uh, bias for or against of petrochemicals. And if you look at Reliance's plant, for example, at Jamnagar. It actually transformed those kinds of approaches to the petrochemical industry and dealing with markets nationally, transformed the way industry looked, big industry looked at the Indian market. India is a tremendous market and having high quality big industry in the biotech sphere and markets within India are, are a huge opportunity, which we are just not touching. We need the daring, similar to that scene in the petrochemical industry of our industry taking on big areas. What are the areas I would take on in a manner which would have a portfolio which allows me to succeed, yet allows a major impact in this complex uh, situation? I would take on two aspects. One, there's extraordinary high quality big data coming in, you know, agribiotech, in cancer biology, in diabetes, in cardiac disease and so on. Partner with a hospital network to generate data from patients in these kinds of backgrounds. We need quality science and we have those quality scientists. We can partner, we can get extraordinarily high quality genomic information, mass spec information, RNA expression information and so on. Analyzing this at a level of the highest standards internationally is feasible it requires a few years of quality training and partnership internationally to train people to analyze this big data. Being able to analyze such big data in a com complex situation opens up the possibility of hitting the international market in personalized medicine in an extraordinarily successful manner. We can be the highest end call center in that domain. and That's an area which we should aim to occupy in three to five years time. This kind of big data will be rapidly generated because of changes in technology, and we need to be prepared for that. Today, the costs of genome sequencing are plummeting. In five to 10 years' time, you can put a drop of blood and uh, a drop of blood with a pinprick, put it into your laptop, get your sequence. What do you do with that data is something which is going to be a huge challenge. So that expertise, any company which wants to develop that to scale is going to be a world leader. With that world leadership position, as the company grows, and this many companies can grow, there's room for many, 
we can choose areas where we can get into drug discovery, vaccine development in a big way with new kinds of technologies. I think both these are completely open areas and extraordinarily exciting things can be done. And my concern with big industry today in these areas is they are you know, worried about the regulatory system, speed of clearances, and so on and so forth to hit the traditional biosimilars and generics market. They are not investing in a big way in these frontline areas. These areas which you are successful today are areas which were frontline 10, 20, 15 years ago. Those, we are, we, we are sort of skimming off the successes of others. Today, we have no option to actually take on leadership positions in these areas, and we can, just as we have done in other kinds of areas. Some years ago, it was unthinkable that India could manufacture a decent car. Today, it's no longer a surprise. The Tatas and Mahindras and others do a great job of it. Similarly, it was unthinkable many years ago that India would have a quality petrochemical factory, and we have that to scale. So therefore, these things look difficult now, but it requires a handful of men and women of daring to take this up, and you know, there are companies which have deep pockets. Taking this up can be hugely successful. So to end, I think you know, stress wherever we are, importance of basic science, because we can't dismiss that. Not having basic science is saying, I don't want to have music, I don't want to have dance, I don't want to have art, I want to have only useful things happening in my culture. It's meaningless, we can't do that, right? So we need to have a foundation of basic science to do anything, and we can't dispense with it. We need to stress the quality of the interface, and we need to have fire in the belly, some amount of fire in the rear, to make our interfacial environments much more effective. And finally, Big business in whatever sector needs to grasp the extraordinary opportunities available in the biotech sector, and they can be world leaders in five years if they do that. Thank you. Certainly. certainly. Uh, you know, before we ask questions, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, on behalf of all the participants in, uh, in this uh, event, I want to heartily congratulate you and thank you for this very illuminating talk. And it almost seemed that you are with us, although <laughs> you're not uh, physically present. And we do look forward to an opportunity when uh, we receive you not virtually, but physically, at our foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'll certainly be there very soon. <laughs> Does anyone have any uh, questions for Dr. Thank you very much, sir, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see a picture of uh, Albert Einstein, I think, at the end of the room. Yes. And uh, I think a lot of what he did is now very useful, but it was completely useless when he did it. So, uh, <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Very good. Thank you. Friends, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, we just heard. Uh, as I said, a very illuminating talk by Dr. Vijay Raghavan. <clears throat> it has set the tone for uh, today's roundtable discussion. I want to join uh, my own voice to the welcome that my colleague extended to Dr. Lele. It's difficult to imagine that uh, here we have an 87 year old or other 87 year young scholar doctor. His specialization is uh, nuclear medicine, as was mentioned. But you know, he he's a lifelong student. So he came and presented this book to me: Homeopathy and Modern Medicine. So a few years ago, he actually did some basic learning on homeopathy and has produced this 
book. He keeps coming to ORF. And today we've had the opportunity to felicitate uh, Dr. Lele. Thank you very much for coming. I want to heartily congratulate my two young colleagues uh, who took the initiative in organizing this roundtable discussion, Siddhant and Shahida. Where's Shahida? Uh -huh. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> Friends, <clears throat> the subject of uh, the roundtable discussion today is very important low-cost, high-impact medical innovations for a better India. And we are discussing this in the context of uh, an exciting new slogan that our Prime Minister has given, Make in India. You know, people of uh, my generation used to, you know, we were only familiar with Made in India. And there was a time when Made in India uh, never evoked any national pride. And people felt that, uh, you know, we cannot really have uh, great products made in India. And there was a fascination for, uh, for imported goods. But India is changing. In the past uh, 20, 25 years after economic liberalization, our, uh, our manufacturing base, our production base has got rapidly modernized and we have some truly world-class trends in some sectors of manufacturing. Dr. Vijay Raghavan mentioned uh, automobiles, but not just, you know, we may have Tata's and Mahindra's, but uh, not uh, Many of you perhaps know that there is not a single car in the world, almost no single car in the world, which doesn't have an auto component manufactured in India. So India has developed a strong base in auto component industry. Similarly, pharmaceuticals, similarly, petrochemicals. But these strengths are not, have not yet become universal across the sectors in Indian economy. And now that Indian economy is uh, growing at a rate, one of the fastest in the world, and it's a matter of pride for us that we have ta overtaken China, which did not seem possible a few years ago. Here we have an opportunity and also necessity to produce, manufacture in India. As Dr. Vijay Raghavan said, that we are a continental nation. We are not like other nations. 1.25 billion people is, is a continental market. Therefore, we cannot be dependent on products that are crucial for our economy, that are crucial for the well-being of our people, that are only imported from outside. Therefore, I feel that Make in India is a very creative adaptation of uh, a slogan that had energized India in previous decades, Swadeshi. You know, there's a, I think that uh, this is the new edition of Swadeshi, but which is in, you know, which is suitable for today's globalized economy. So Swadeshi meant that we, we only depend on what we manufacture ourselves, which today is not possible in the interconnected, interdependent, highly integrated economy of which India is part. So what our leaders are now saying is that we, we invite investments, foreign investments, but manufacture here. Similarly, as again Dr. Vijay Raghavan was saying, it's an appeal to big industries, Indian industries, to manufacture and export. 
So make India a manufacturing hub in all the big areas that are of crucial importance to our economy. Something that we had neglected, friends, some 15, 20 years ago. I remember the big debate between clicks and bricks, you know, when India's software industry was beginning to take off. There was a debate whether along with software, we should also develop indigenous strengths in hardware, IT hardware. I was in government those days, and there were people, very highly placed people, who said, you know, bricks don't matter. You know, manufacturing, hardware manufacturing doesn't matter. All we should concentrate is software. That is our strength. We have smart people, bright people, and they'll conquer the world. Of course, we have done remarkably well in soft software, but the neglect of IT hardware has actually begun to hurt, hurt us. You know, today we import nearly 11 to 12 billion dollars of IT hardware each year. India is a big importer, and it's, it's beginning to have a big pressure on our current account, account deficit. And therefore, I feel that uh, make in India in all sectors that are important for India, important for India's future growth, important for the welfare of our people, has to become a national priority as our Prime Minister has actually made it, made it now. So make in India in defense manufacturing, make in India for solar, and tomorrow, for your information, friends, we are going to have uh, a similar roundtable discussion in IIT Bombay in collaboration with IIT Bombay on the theme, Make in India for Solar India. Because solar is going to be big, and we must, instead of importing solar panels in huge, huge numbers, we must have our own indigenous manufacturing base. So make in India in medical hardware, in construction equipment, all these areas are extremely important. And along with manufacturing, it goes without saying that we must have our own R&D base, and therefore research, including basic research, as Dr. Vijay Raghavan pointed out very rightly. This must now become a national mission. We have just begun, and I'm very happy that uh, with this uh, roundtable discussion, we are making our own contribution to this mission by choosing an area that's of extreme relevance to India. We must have low-cost health care. We cannot, we simply cannot imitate the United States or other Western countries in taking care of the health of our people. Because even the United States, it's becoming unsustainable for them to have high cost health care. So we need low cost health care but high impact, which is only possible through science, technology, and indigenous manufacturing. So thank you very much. And it's so encouraging to see that uh, we have uh, thought leaders and action leaders in this space who come today for uh, the round table discussion. We are certain to have a very fruitful discussion. And we'll report the, the gist of the discussion to opinion, not, not just opinion makers, but policy makers, like Dr. Vijay Raghavan and others in the government. We are soon expecting the uh, Secretary of Healthcare, Sujata Sawe. We want Maharashtra to take the lead in make in India as far as uh, medical hardware is concerned. <coughs> Thank you very much, and let's have a very fruitful discussion. Dhaniwad. To have everyone do a quick introduction about themselves, let's just take 10 to 15 seconds and tell who you are and where you're from, despite us having detailed biographies mailed out to you repeatedly. We'd like everyone to know who's who. So we just start with you, Rajan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rajan Luthra. I work in the chairman's office in Reliance Industries. 
Hi everyone, my name is Sri Sanyal. I'm from the Canadian Consulate General here in Mumbai and I'm responsible for the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program for Canada and India. Good morning, I'm Yasmin Dubash, Trade Commissioner at the Consulate General of Canada and I'm responsible for assisting Canadian companies to set up in India and find joint venture partners, distributors, etc. I'm Naga Prakasam, I'm an angel investor and also a mentor at uh, IIM Bangalore and also interested in uh, rural innovation. So um, uh, we formed a foundation in Madurai to promote entrepreneurship in rural Tamil Nadu. Hello, I'm uh, Shomo Mukherjee. I'm a faculty in the uh, Department of Bioscience Bioengineering in IIT Bombay. I work in the area of wide-scale deployable uh, sensors for environment, health, and security. Hi, I'm Rinti Banerjee. I'm a professor in Bioscience and Bioengineering at IIT Bombay. A um, mixed background of uh, medicine and engineering, and uh, my group works on developing new technologies for healthcare. Hello, I'm Dr. Vail Lomini. Was a scientist, is an entrepreneur now. A low cost, a high impact diagnostic solutions for a better India. I could manage in last 18 years and I will share some more in the during the course of the day. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Chaitanya. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm the founder of the SuperDoc app. We help doctors spread wellness outside their clinics. We also help patients do teleconsultations uh, with the best doctors. Hello, everyone. I'm Surbhi. I work at GenX Ventures, which is the VC arm of Reliance Industries. We invest in technology startups from India and abroad across various sectors, including healthcare. Hello, everyone. My name is Nanika Kakkar, and I'm also from Gen Next Ventures. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajay Ramasubramaniam. Uh, I run a startup accelerator and a seed fund by the name Zone Startups India. It's an Indo Canadian joint venture between Ryerson University in Toronto and the BSC Institute, which is a subsidiary of the Bombay Stock Exchange. Hello, good morning everybody. I'm Ankur and uh, I'm from Zone Startups India. Uh, we run a technology accelerator at the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, hello, good morning. I'm Nitin Kale. I am with NanoSniff Technologies Private Limited. It's a startup incubated at IIT Bombay. Uh, we are making microsensors for uh, securities, that is uh, detecting, detecting explosives and uh, microsensors for detecting cardiac markers. Uh, we were funded by Bayrak, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan's arm, and we were also funded by Grand Challenges Canada, I think people from Canada are here, just to tell them. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Dr. Prabodhan Poddar. I'm uh, working as an assistant professor uh, with the King Edward Memorial Hospital, which is one of the largest tertiary care centers in Mumbai. We are doing a lot of research work on uh, various topics. I belong to the Department of the Orthopedics, and uh, we're doing a lot of work in hip, knee replacements, and arthroscopy. So it's all technologically related, and I'm here to discuss more about it. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Vishal Marwa. I'm a physician and entrepreneur, and I run a social enterprise, Vishwas, uh, where we offer a leadership program for young medical doctors to enable them to be good family physicians and enable them to start their own clinics also run an innovation lab where we bring together doctors, designers, and interdisciplinary thinkers to collaborate on working on some of the complex healthcare challenges. Thank you. Hi, my name is Akhil. I work at Dasra, and I'm part of the Dasra Girl Alliance, which is a $14 million initiative which uh, looks at creating an ecosystem of various players, social entrepreneurs, NGOs, the government, private uh, players, on focusing on issues around Adolescent, maternal, and child health. Hi. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pankaj Raut. So I'm co-founder of Dimension NXG. So we develop hardware and software applications based on 3D printing technology. And we are accelerated with Zone Startups. Good morning. Uh, my name is Pradeep Pillai. I work for Society for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, the technology business incubator in IIT Bombay. And we help early stage startups. Hi, I'm Subhashi Sarkar and uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Health Vectors. Um, you'll hear about uh, Health Vectors just a bit. I just wanted to say that I'm probably here in this room only doctor who's not a medical doctor. 
Hi, I am Dr. Syed Mubarak. I work as a lead physician and a medical advisor to Cisco Bangalore. Uh, my background is uh, medicine as well as I've done my graduation in uh, biomedical informatics. Morning. I'm Dr. Ravi Nair. Uh, I'm an academic, I'm a surgeon, and uh, I've been in the space of bioinnovations initially as an academic because I ran a program between a hospital and an engineering college. <coughs> I'm currently dean in a center for academic research, and I mentor a lot of startups in this space. Hello, I'm Bhavesh Thakkar. I'm vice president of Chogule Medi Consult, which is a healthcare IT firm, and we are into the space of electronic health records, uh, telemedicine and customized software development for healthcare applications. Uh, good morning, I'm Dr. Rohini Chaugle. I've been, as Dr. said, I'm a academician. I was a professor of medicine, heading the medicine department in Bombay Hospital. Uh, I've been in this IT space with healthcare delivery. We are more interested in healthcare delivery for the last 15 years, how we can use IT as a doctors to uh, you know, give a better care at low cost, sir, as you said and make a better impact. Hi, I'm Dr. Sulevan Merchant, Dean of Cyan Hospital, which is the uh, caters to 75% of Mumbai's suburb, entire Mumbai's population, that's the suburbs. We have a OPD which goes well over 19 lakh patients a year. A casualty of over 1 lakh 80 thousand. That's way beyond any other thing. But the po point is I'd like to mentor students and uh, going to low cost, high impact areas and uh, mentoring students into thinking beyond medicine, beyond being a doctor, beyond just earning money, but being a good citizen, doing the best for the country. I'm going to do my best. I have a few ideas, but unfortunately, I have to leave now, so I'll share them with you over email. Given some time, I can do it briefly too. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Vineet Gupta. I represent GE India. Uh, I work with the government affairs and policy team uh, as part of uh, G India's uh, corporate organization in India. And uh, I support the healthcare business in principle from the policy aspects and the regulatory basis issues. Hi, my name is John Kuruvela. I work for Genex Ventures, Reliance's VC arm. Uh, been a serial entrepreneur, had a string of successes, had a failure, IPO'd one. And now I'm passionately involved with the startup ecosystem. At Genex, we invest and we accelerate companies. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am Dr. Prashant Jha, uh, training by training a physician and an engineer. I run a program and uh, work for a program at All India Institute of Medical Sciences called Stanford India Biodesign. And uh, it's a collaboration between the Stanford University, uh, QUT in Australia, University of Tokyo, uh, IIT Delhi and AIMS, and uh, we run this program to create uh, innovations for the needs in India. And uh, I think we we create startups every year, at least two or three. And uh, over the last uh, seven, eight years, we have had uh, around 50 patents coming out of our program, around a dozen startups, uh, one of which is funded by Naga today morning. I met him, and the first thing I asked him, he said, yes, I have invested in one of the companies that have come out. I also run a journal. Uh, called BMJ Innovations in partnership with the British Medical Journal. Uh, this is the world's first uh, general medical innovations journal. And I am myself an entrepreneur. Uh, some of the technologies that I have invented, uh, they are now funded and uh, we are developing them. I'll talk about them further when I'm presenting. Hi. <coughs> Good afternoon. Sorry for sitting in the corner. Just trying to be a little away from the AC. Uh, my name is Subhash Ghosh. I run a technology consulting firm based out of London. We are in the space of technology transfer, knowledge transfers. Uh, why am I here? Uh, we closely work on the AIM Health space, and uh, let's talk more about it as we progress. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This, uh, I'm, yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gaurav Godbole. I'm the co-founder of Dimension Energy Private Limited. So this is my partner sitting out there, Pankaj. Right, thank you very much. And with that, uh, sorry, there's one more person. Sorry. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Ali Khurajia. I'm a senior consultant with KPMG India, uh, and uh, I'm representing the public health department right now. I work with the public health department uh, for IT consulting and other policy making and uh, operational assessment. So, pleasure to be here, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to get started with the session, and we are just about four minutes behind schedule, so we'll get quickly started.
the first company, we'll have a few startups talk about their product and their story, and then we'll open it up for discussion, and you're free to ask questions and make observations. Uh, we're going to start with Dimension NXG. In case you've been wondering what that contraption in the corner is, that's their 3D printer, and it is printing something. They will come and tell you all about it. Thank you. Dimension NXG. I'm Pankaj Raut, co-founder of Dimension NXG. So as I just told you, we develop hardware and software applications based on 3D printing technology. What we believe is technology by itself doesn't have much value unless you develop a layer of applications over it. Let's consider like internet. Unless your applications such as emails, Facebook, SaaS, you, it doesn't have much value. In the similar manner, what we are doing is we are developing application which can be used in healthcare uh, over the 3D printing technology. So the application is called Presurgy. It's transforming how surgeries are happening. So when surgeons operate, they operate in three dimensions. But all the tools they have to pre-plan a surgery are either two-dimensional or shown on a three on a, a computer screen. The biggest downfall of all of this is this can lead to misunderstanding of a patient's anatomy, which can further lead to complications or a need for exploratory surgery. The solution we are proposing here is by uh, leveraging 3D printing technology, we take this basically two-dimensional data, convert them into three-dimensional models, as you can see over here, uh, 3D print them, and give it to the doctors so doctors can pre-plan surgeries. There are some cases we have 3D printed. So in terms of complex surgeries, it has helped doctor pre-plan the surgeries even before the patient is into the operating table. But then we want to take this a step further. Uh, we are not just uh, keeping it to pre-planning. We are thinking about taking it uh, in terms of by taking this two-dimensional data, converting 3D models, and then making in custom implants, which are then 3D printed. Right now, custom implants are 3D printed outside India and are uh, selling at a retail price about 3 to 4x times what's sold at US or in uh, Europe market. There is an old adage, time is money. But then in a surgery room, time can mean much more than money. It can mean a patient's life. Uh, according to our uh, pilot run, we have figured out that pre-planning surgeries using 3D models does reduce the time in a surgery. Uh, as the complex surgeries are pre-planned using actual models, uh, the, this mitigates the risk from the hospitals, uh, thus resulting in uh, improved patient outcomes. And third and fourth and the additional impact is in terms of uh, educational value. So these models can be used to educate the patient or even the students, medical students, uh, about complex surgeries, how the surgery is going to happen. So that's pre-surgery, transforming how surgeries happen. So we have been featured in various Indian uh, news outlets as well. Pre-surgy came into existence had it not been for Google Startup Weekend. Uh, Startup Weekend is a concept where in 54 hours you ideate, uh, do market research, do market validation, and uh, product validation. So none of the co-founders knew each other before the event. We met at IIT Bombay, we did the event. That's where we got the, how do you say, the comfort level to get into this field. We understood the market and we see, okay, there is a valid, this is something we can take ahead. Uh, we were bootstrapped after that, uh, we started few pilot runs with some hospitals and then we have incubated at Zone Startups where we are taking this even a step ahead. About me, I am Pankaj Raut, I have done mechatronics engineering from London South Bank University. I have always been interested in developing various applications for technology, so I have worked with MIT Media Labs where essentially we were taking in uh, social media offline worked on developing applications for Google Glasses and some AR work. I've set up one of the best 3D scanners in Europe, which is installed in Selfridges London right now, and have been interviewed and featured in US, UK outlet, media outlets. Uh, Gaurav Godbole, my co-founder, he is a uh, BNG uh, in computer from PICT and has done MBA in finance from Pumba. He has an all-round work experience from corporate, uh, educational, and in terms of public, per public sector work experience as well. Uh, issues we faced or what we thought could be improved through our journey in terms of there was no platform wherein we could interact with doctors or the industry and get a responsive feedback. That is something we could have in system or a standard protocol. Ki how can we 
bring startups closer to healthcare in institutes wherein there is a more closer or transparent interaction. It's not just, ki, okay, we are interested, we'll call you back. Let's meet up some other time. Uh, and in terms of proactive interest from government hospitals as well, wherein we faced issues such as we did not get good enough response. Ki, okay, they liked the technology, they were interested, but then that's it. Uh, it did stop that. So more of a proactive interest from government hospitals. That's from my side. Thank you. Before I go, so I thought uh, doc, I could take this opportunity, Dr. Rinti Banerjee. Uh, I've been working on a prosthesis for kids. Like, I don't know if you guys have read it. There's this girl who lost her leg and her mother in an accident. So I'm just trying to develop a prosthesis which would help a child squat. Apparently, there's nothing in the world. I've talked to a lot of universities abroad. Nobody seems to be interested. I think if your team can take this up or somebody else, we could work together and you know uh, enable a lot of Indian kids to get normal activity because uh, physical development is important, but psychological, as you all know, a child losing a childhood in the first five years of life in neural networks, activity, cortex, everything, that'll be really nice. So if you can do that, I appreciate that. Uh, it'll be a little random here because I've just uh, kind of made points from everybody. Uh, talking about medical innovation, and low cost, I think uh, before I start any of that, I would like to once again reiterate vitamin D's role as a low cost, high impact thing. I'll just uh, elaborate briefly. If anybody can take this up, vitamin D. It is costing 23 rupees as an injection, which can be taken orally. All the oral ones are pretty expensive and have to be taken every week. So if we can give this to everybody uniformly, above four years throughout our country we can make a huge difference to a lot of things including immunity uh, for women it's calcium because without vitamin d calcium doesn't go in calcium doesn't go in without protein so calcium has to be taken with protein vitamin d with fat because it's a fat soluble vitamin so if we can just spread this around it's going to change and in fact i've got lots of references during my review work lancet articles and all which clearly show the relationship between low vitamin d levels and a high tuberculosis level. So the lower, 10 times lower vitamin D, 10 times higher TB. So we are looking at a lot of innovation here without, you know, uh, just getting into some basics here. So if we can do this and spread, we can change the face of TB dramatically, I believe, along with all the other aspects of nutrition, environment, things like that. While on TB, there is a unique uh, development of uh, PCR, which I think, uh, Dr. B from uh, it was mentioned about innovation. I think uh, the b most beautiful innovation is that uh, PCR has been developed by a student in Georgia Tech University. I was counseling there, so I just got to know that. And uh, this guy was drunk, so not recommending anybody to be drunk. But he opened the lab at night. He suddenly got a brainwave, and that's how PCR was formed. I think we need to have that in India, where we encourage students to not drink, but to go to labs while labs are fixed 9 to 5, if the professor is not there, the lab is shut. So any bright ideas that go beyond time, not necessarily under the influence of alcohol, mind you. But that, that could help change a lot of things. Along with uh, Gene Expert, which I just wanted to say, is one of the most beautiful PCR inventions. Uh, fortunately for, I've negotiated this French company called Cephade. For, uh, if somebody can do it in India, fantastic. But it can diagnose TB within two hours. And uh, it's a simple printer-based uh, technology, like a printer. Just you need a cartridge to load and put it in. No training required, no special room required. So if anybody can uh, push this up, it is available for government and municipal hospitals for half the price, which is a huge reduction, including the cartridges. Two hours TB means imagine a person going for four months to take treatment under DOTS program. Twice or thrice a week, he has to take off a daily wage worker. And he loses all of that time and money, his family suffers. He still somehow stoically goes through it. At the end of four months, he's told, you know what, Apko, you got MDR-TB. This guy doesn't understand what MDR-TB, he just thinks the doctor's nuts. He's not capable of treating him. So he just goes off and we, each MDR-TB person will spread it to 25 others during the year. So we're looking at a cost of five to seven lakhs. We're trying to save that per person initially but we are going to spend 25 times that amount at the end of the year. Besides 25 spread, each one will be spreading this further. So I think this is where we are losing out in the TB fight and the MDR-TB, very low cost, 
high impact things are already available. One is vitamin D, second is Gene Expert. And Gene Expert has the beautiful thing, it gives you uh, sensitivity to the most commonly used drug, rifampicin, in uh, tuberculosis. And rifampicin is a surrogate marker for Isonia Z. So we can take out MDR TB right early. In fact, we were the first in the world to use Gene Expert on lymph nodes because it was standardized for pleural effusion and uh, sputum. But I realized I knew about that drunk guy story. So you just need a little DNA, and we have DNA in our hair, nails, everything. So all the bacterial DNA is definitely going to be there and everything. So we did lymph nodes, and now it's incorporated as a worldwide standard protocol for use of Gene Expert. So I think these two things can make a huge uh, difference to TB. If we can, uh, I'll be happy to share my number and email address. Shahida has it. So anybody interested can pick it up. I'll be leaving, so I'll be sorry I can't exchange uh, this directly. And uh, as far as uh, technology goes, I think GE has a wonderful technology which I'd like to review. Started it at Cyan Hospital, the first in the country, where wireless fetal monitoring. This is something very unique, and I think we complement GE for developing that. And uh, it has the potential to change the face of uh, safety of babies delivered. In fact, in the last two weeks since we introduced it, we already saved three stillborn children. I mean, children from being stillborn, rather. It is a beautiful technology, very, very uh, economical, actually. And it has the potential. I'm not a marketing guy, but I don't want to plug it as such. But every pregnant lady would probably get this at some point of time. But I'm more interested in the healthcare of the poor. So we've seen to it that every lady who delivers a baby would be uh, getting the facility. We have three units. We'll be getting seven more. So each and every, we have a very high volume load. Like our deliveries go up to 100 a day, which is a world record. I think nobody else can. 60 to 70 is the average per day. So we're going to use it for 10 to 12 mothers who deliver at any given point of time. So hopefully, because what happens is a lot of other things, cerebral palsy or a lot of other uh, mental problems occur in kids because of problems during delivery. So hopefully we can use that as a game changer to do that. A uh, request for the uh, 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 think tank policy maker. I gave you an example last time of my friend Swati Piramal who has probably been the only drug discoverer to spend a billion dollars per drug and discovering uh, Alzheimer's markers. And she wanted to release it in India first because being the patriot that she is. Unfortunately, she tried for many months, almost eight to nine months, and they were told there is no FDA approval. But she said, this is the first time you're producing something. Why can't we? We've already tested it here. But our government said, we do not take anything without FDA approval. So she finally tried a lot, released it in Europe, got the European approval, FDA approval, and then released it in India. So if you can work like that, if somebody is capable of doing something amazing, I think it's up to us to support that in the system. As far as innovations in medical education goes, I'd already mentioned this last time, but I need to reiterate, there's already an IIT-sponsored NIC, National Informatic Council approved classroom. And I have, we've taken a policy decision in the corporation that any surplus budget at the end of the year, which is plenty because of the slow procedures, would be used into developing classrooms, NIC certified. So I'd like help from IIT to come and advise us on that and how to take this forward. These are government rate contracts, so they're very easily implementable. And figure this nationally. We can have this next plan as to how to take education further by video conferencing. In fact, there's this nice guy doing teleradiology in Delhi, Dr. Sumer Sethi, a radiologist. He'd come here, he trains a lot of people for free for CET entrance exams. And he did this remarkable thing of using free satellite bandwidth to cut across the country, 50 live audiences you could interact. So we have this huge potential. We are good with IT, we're good with software, and we have this free bandwidth available. So if the government can spare that for education, it doesn't have to be medical. It could be simple school level, college level, whatever. Any national program can easily be covered to so, such a big area through free satellite bandwidth. And this is Sumer Sethi gave me that idea, so I really want to thank him for that. And this can cover almost all kinds of education you do including live workshops and hospitals, how do you do the first surgery. Dr. Suresh Rao, a friend of mine, innovated now, probably the world's first surgery for a baby, which we read it in Times of India. So if he can share that, there's so many other people who can pick up, because journals take some time. It takes about two years before a thing is published in the journal. We're doing... Not ours. Not yours, okay. Online has changed. But print journals, which people... And students somehow don't refer to journals that much as this. So we need to change that culture, too. As far as... Uh, uh, CSR activities go. I think we can work together. It's a very untapped domain. I had to help this little girl, and that was covered in the press. This guy, Samsung Medical Health World 
leader was around. He, like the story, came to meet me and uh, donated two and a half crores worth of equipment for Cyan Hospital. I think that's there in the press now. But we join hands. We can tap that untapped uh, area too. And lastly, I'd like to talk about using existing setups, what you had also mentioned earlier, and everybody seems to say, all the companies like GE have now started developing software in India, which is, I mean, really good. And most all the multinationals are developing the software in India, but they're missing out of one key area. Clinical development is not happening in our hospitals and not happening in our medical colleges, which is going to save them a lot of money. It is going to save them a lot of time because each patient abroad charges anywhere from, I'll give you an example of a CT scanner. To get into the scanner, he'll take 150 euros or $100 or whatever. So in India, it's for free, and as long as it's ethically done and safe, we can explore that potential, give our service to the patients for free, because when you set up a hardware in a hospital, it, the hospital gets that kind of thing as a donation anyway. So we can improve healthcare, we can improve uh, efficiency of uh, production, like your production time can be reduced significantly by that. And I think setting up of uh, molecular imaging labs, I think each, each company should take that. Whatever existing uh, equipment is available, you can do molecular imaging on that. We need to set up a molecular imaging hub in India. And that is the way discoveries will happen. It's already there all over the world, and India is lagging behind. So if we can do that, that will be really wonderful. With that, I think... Uh, I'll end now, won't take too much time. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'll be happy to share my email and telephone number with anyone. Shahida can do that, please. Thanks once again. Rinti, I look forward to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merchant. I'm just going to hand the mic to my colleague, Gautam Kirtane. Yep. Uh, before our next presentation, uh, we'd like to welcome our guest of honor, His uh, Excellency, Mr. Richard Bale, Consul General of uh, Canada and uh, longstanding friend of the Observer Research Foundation. I request Shahida to please welcome Mr. Bale. Uh, okay, we can uh, uh, proceed with the next presentation, please. Can you all hear me? Uh, I want to start off my presentation uh, by saying thank you uh, to Siddhant. Uh, he took a lot of effort in uh, making sure that uh, Health Vectors presented its uh, case here. Uh, thank you to Observers Research Foundation for giving us the opportunity. I also wanted to thank uh, Gen Next Ventures, and uh, John is sitting right here the amount of number of hours that uh, they have spent. We are the first batch of Gen Next uh, Ventures and the Gen Next Innovation Hub. And uh, extremely proud of being part of that because uh, they transformed us. And uh, I just hope that you guys remember that whenever you see a good innovative startup, uh, please refer them to Gen Next. Uh, they can do miracles for the company. Uh, I wanted to um, also um, tell you that uh, the subject that I'm broaching today is very near and dear to everybody. And I wouldn't say dear, but I would say definitely near. Um, and so whatever we can do to break this uh, shackle of uh, non-communicable chronic diseases on the, you know, that it's wreaking on the human uh, population around the world is really alarming and tremendous. So. If we can do anything to help uh, billions live their life healthy with certainty, is that's what we're trying to do. Wanted to introduce you to Shobtik, a very good friend of mine, celebrating his 32nd birthday here. Okay, and uh, just two months after he finished celebrating this, I get this call from his wife in India. And the four letters, uh, or the four words that she uttered, changed my life completely. She said, Shoptik is no more. A young 32-year-old strapping healthy guy, just gone. And this is a guy that does health checks on a regular basis. And you know, he uses his birthdays to do health checks. That's how much he treasured his life. I was beside myself. What I found out is he passed away of cardiovascular complications. He gave precisely 10 minutes to his wife. 
Now, when I started looking at this whole thing, I, I, I was beside myself. You can imagine what I was feeling. You know, my degree in engineering, my MBA from Wharton, my lavish life in the US, uh, all my good job and everything meant nothing, really meant nothing to me. I had to do something. I had to find out what could really be done in order to change this. And if I had my say, nobody else, you know, would be a Shoptik ever again, OK? So uh, when I started digging into this a little bit more, what I found out was it's not just Shoptik. And I'm sure you guys can all uh, recall people that you know that, that left early uh, because of non-communicable diseases. So what I found out was that it's a global epidemic. We all know about it. Now, when I start to delve into it, these are numbers. And I say 47, again, I say the word trillion, OK? That is what's going to be wasted because of non-communicable diseases by year 2030. It is killing 36 million people every year. And you know what? One out of every three baby born today anywhere in the world you know, is going to be diabetic. That's reality. That's the statistics. And do you know why the numbers are so ludicrous? Because in spite of all the advances in medical science and technology, and you've heard a lot about all that, we are still stuck in the curative domain, which is you detect and then you contain. All right? I'll also say this to you. This is a challenge. A lot of you are part of the hospitals and uh, you know, clinics and places where you go and do preventive health checks. Ask them what preventive health check really means. And this is not something that I'm pinpointing in India. This is a worldwide thing. I've, I've been in the US for a long time. And they'll tell you, we catch the disease real early, and we stop it from growing big. Now try catching diabetes early. There are many doctors here. How many of you are going to be able to reverse that in a subject? Try catching hypertension early. So the point of the matter is that in order to a be able to prevent these diseases, you got to be able to predict. Only then can you prevent it. And you have to take steps after you predict, right? So that is one of the problems. In the case of Shoptik, for example, what we found out was not only did he not understand the severity of his risks, even the doctors did not know how to convey severity. They knew he had some risk factors. But how severe is it? And what are the simple step-by-step -step things he could have done in order to avoid that. So it is something that is of a concern. And you know, I have been through many health checks after the Shoptik incident, personally, to go and see this. I'll tell you what I find at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I find this doctor sitting in front of 15 pages of reports. And he's asking 10 questions, forgetting three. He has his office distractions. And then finally, he has a quota to fill. I'm sorry. That's what it is. Guess what? Uh, to get optimal solution is a miracle. And I'm worried that there are, more no, that there are not more show things happening every day. So what I would like to do is kind of introduce to you the company Health Vectors, which was formed essentially to change this paradigm, shift this paradigm from a detect and a contain paradigm to a predict and prevent paradigm. Only then can we make some kind of an impact on this chronic disease, endemic, epidemic, whatever you call it. But not just that, you've got to be able to do that and then empower the right people, the people who need your help, at a time when it matters and at a price that is affordable. And the question, therefore, is how do we do this? Well, all we do is take some information from you, which you take to your clinical data, more than 100 parameters, but we focus on few uh, blood, urine, ECG, eco, physicals, things like that. And then we take your personal health data, which is about 30, 30 parameters, which relates to your lifestyle, food habits, exercise habits, family medical history, known medical conditions, mental health and stress, all those things. And we put it into that analytics engine that we developed. Again, this analytics engine is based on a lot of evidence-based science, 
a lot of cognitive computing, how a panel of expert doctors would think. And last but not the least is what I call artificial intelligence or machine learning, where a system constantly learns and does one better every day. And when we put that into that machine, we have these tools that are there, which are most important ones are the risk predictor and mitigator, and I'll share that with you a little bit more. But we have also created that neural net, which is very, very helpful now to the doctors. We are actually, many doctors that I went to initially threw me out of their room because they said, what are you trying to do? I mean, you're trying to replace a doctor. That is not exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help the doctors and be able to help them as best as I can. So that is that neural net, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. At the end of it, what we get out of all of this is actionable insights for that individual, actionable insights for the corporations. Maybe a company wants to have all their employees go through this process. The employer then gets to know what program to hold in Bangalore, what to hold in Delhi. Not a one-size-fits-all, not a spray-and-pray technique. You know, do something that matters at a time that matters, at a place that matters. I've talked to you about Shoptik. I want to now introduce you to another person by the name Nikhilesh. She's become a good friend now. And Nikhilesh, in many ways, was quite similar to Shoptik. You know, in many ways, he was a carbon copy of Shoptik, except that he got a chance to embrace the health vector solutions. And guess what? We were able to give him some very clear directions through a process that we have created. This is just nothing more than deconvoluting all that is known through evidence-based science and creating a solution that, I would say, is easily, easily consumable by an individual. So look, he had 72% risk of getting to cardiovascular diseases when we actually caught him. And we showed him by doing a simple things like quitting smoking, by taking out his, increasing his HDL, and decreasing his total cholesterol and his BP, we were able to bring his risks down in six months only. And yes, there is this power of motivation, but that comes from target setting, that comes from actually showing him things are improving because he's doing things that we've been asking him to do. And in six months, his risk has come down from 72% to 30%. And we give specific targets. We just don't tell you eat right and exercise. You know, specific targets that you got to achieve. So all I can tell you is that Nikhilesh is now going to celebrate many, many more birthdays. And this is not just an India problem. I told you again, again and again. This is a world problem. Let's join this predictive revolution and start this revolution and change the world right from right here in India. And now, because we have structured data, we can do so much. Let me show you how. Through this entire continuum, from being a healthy person to an unhealthy person, unfortunately, we go through this continuum, every one of us. You know, we have to go get testing done, get clinical data. We have to change our lifestyle. We have to go get exercise because we were not getting exercise. All these different things that we're talking about involves different people, different entities, different organizations, different, uh, different, different people get involved in this. And the way we are kind of uh, engaging with these people is shown in this slide here. When it comes to health checks, online, at home, on-site, in-store, all these are possibilities that we're exploring, that we are moving forward with. When it comes to the data that we are collecting, we are collecting a humongous amount of data uh, from individuals. There are pharma companies and insure com insurance companies that are uh, really interested in what we are doing. Hospitals say that, Subhashish, you are getting in touch with so many people, you know exactly who needs what help, why don't you just connect them to us? And sure, we are more than happy if the individual is willing. As far as data insights, there are so many research organizations, you know that what we can actually do with all of this information. But then the more important thing is connecting buyers and sellers, because you see, there is this nutritional comp nutritionists and nutraceutical companies. There are all these different organizations. And we have somebody from GE here. 
GE has come and plainly told me that, Subhashish, we want this flat data file that you're collecting on this individual, which has all the information, including images of his heart, including the heart pumping and the video, and then the cardiologist inside. All this in one flat file, we want to make our devices smarter. So there are different ways to engage with us, and these are some. I wanted to share with you a simple dashboard that we give an individual these days. We're just starting this process, so it's in a beta format. We give them not only the test history, their health snapshot, diet do's and don'ts. Again, these diet do's and don'ts are system-generated solutions which is vetted by, by proper individuals or people who are capable of vetting them. Diet plan, if I know what your ethnicity is, if I know what your, uh, uh, if I know what your uh, you know, preferences are, I can actually create a diet plan automatically for you uh, because I know your medical condition. But then look at this, what we also have, not only your health scorecard and your health risks, but we know what recommendations need to be given to you. And therefore, what we're able to tell you, okay, if you need to see a cardiologist because of your low HDL and your ECG and ECO results, we will point out who the cardiologists are in your area. You can actually book an appointment through us. And once you've done that, we will be able to send your data directly to them. You just need to go visit them and get proper care. So that's the kind of integrated solution I'm talking about. These are the people that we have connected with so far, people who I call uh, you know, ambassadors who have actually taken up what we are doing and have uh, been able to move this forward. The partners that we are talking about here are the key people. We're just talking about Fortis, Columbia, Asia, and the different organizations out here that have actually embraced our solutions, and they're taking it forward and providing it to the masses. And then, uh, you know, I wanted to end this whole conversation by saying that, you know, we always talk about uh, solving a problem, but why India and why now is the problem, is the question that I wanted to address today because of this audience that I have. India, as you all know, is already known as the diabetes capital of the world. One out of every 10, actually the number is one out of every eight in urban India is I age group of 20 to 29, either diabetic or pre-diabetic, and 60% of all deaths in India are related to this. And by the way, let's not look beyond this number at the bottom, $4.6 trillion. Again, trillion dollars will be lost due to non-communicable diseases and mental health. But then why health vectors? Because we have created a highly scalable, highly effective, and a vetted solution to combat non-communicable diseases. So I can, we can touch the masses because we've used in IT, information technology, to create some of these solutions. And then it is individualized, yet automated. It's error-free, and it's quick. It's rapid, yet it's good quality. And last but not the least, Health Vectors is building the largest action-oriented integrated personal data network. I wanted to leave you guys with uh, this whole conversation that is happening all over about Swachh Bharat. There's also another component, Swasth Bharat, that is picking up also. And Health Vectors wants to be right smack in the middle of all of, in all of this. It needs a culture change that you can go to a doctor even when you're not sick. They can give you advice before you fall sick and not after. Even then they can help you. The infrastructure that needs to be developed for this there are entities here that can help this. And we are creating this connected platform, which still needs incentivization and motivation. Please help in each, uh, each one of you help it the way you possibly can. And guess what? Non-communicable diseases can be eradicated. We just have to give it the best shot we can. If there are any questions, please thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we're going to save questions and observations and comments uh, for the open forum, which will be after the other companies are done. Uh, so please use the ORF notepads in your folder judiciously. Uh, up next is Dr. Prashant Cha from Ames Stanford India Biodesign. Dr. Cha. Thank you, ORF, for having me here. So I have an interesting journey, and uh, I'd like to share some of the failures and successes. I have failed uh, more often than I have succeeded. So as I told you during the introduction, I serve as a consulting faculty 
at the uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, uh, helping run a program which is funded by DBT. And I run a journal and I run a company. So kind of uh, in the thick of a lot of things. So what is this program? It's a very interesting program that we do. I would say it's a CERN or a large hadron collider where we collide physicians, engineers, entrepreneurs, and designers. I think it is very, very unique because our education system is extremely walled, like a, like a fort. It does not allow people, you don't have the, the systems like you have a university in US where in your cafeteria you meet an engineer someday and then you have an idea and you come up with a startup. We are doctors, we are supposed to learn medicine, we are supposed to treat patients. I'm an engineer, I'm supposed to do uh, a mechanical lab, electronics lab, uh, IT lab. I'm an MBA, I'm supposed to know Excel sheets, I'm supposed to make beautiful PowerPoints, impress people. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm supposed to make money, God knows how. So this started around eight years ago, and uh, I think the most beautiful part of this program is that it helps people find teammates. So we have, uh, we started with just four, taking four students whom we call fellows, I was also a fellow of the program. I got introduced to the program as a fellow. And uh, people who have done crazy things, like, uh, and you have, I'm a huge fan of Steve Jobs, and there are two posters here, who may not have succeeded, but who might have failed. So our selection criteria are very unique. Uh, when we interview, we ask people about how have you failed, how many times have you failed, what have you failed doing, and what have you learned from them? And they have to justify it uh, we do not take a written entrance exam or there is uh, no weightage given on whether your CGPA is uh, 10 or 9.8 or A's or B's. And it has been a very interesting journey because people, all these people, learn a lot from each other. At the end of our program, which runs into one year, they cease to become doctors, engineers, entrepreneurs, and designers. They fall in love with a problem with his, which is worth solving. And... Uh, that is what we do. We do innovation in a very, very different way. Uh, I have trained at IIT, I have trained in medical schools, I have trained as a GP in UK. Wherever I have seen research, research is driven by a PI. So a PI runs a lab, they have an idea, they have PhD students, they have more ideas that are incremental ideas, they do a literature survey, they do a literature research, and they say, okay, let us come up with this something, let us build a hypothesis. Let us do more experiments and let us publish. We say, no, that's not the way to do it. We follow a three I process, which is called identify, invent, and implement. So what we do is, we bring these people together. Uh, we bring a shrink, uh, which is a nifty, nifty name for a psychologist, to help them survive each other, to let them deal with their egos so that they can talk to each other rationally. And what we do is we put them in the clinics, in the different tiers of the healthcare system. And uh, Siddhant already stole from me what I had a secret for all of you today is the question that I usually ask is whether we are a developed country, a developing country, or an underdeveloped country. And if you look at the healthcare system in our country, you don't need to go anywhere else. You want the American model, you go to the Fortis and the Apollo. You want the NHS model, you go to the ESI and the CGHS. You want the physician entrepreneur model, walk into a clinic. You want to go into the Nigerian model, go to a PHC in, I'll not take a name of a state, there could be nationalistic sentiments around it. I can talk about my state, I'm genetically a Bihari. So you could go and walk into a PHC into a North Bihar and you might not find a doctor over there. It's so difficult uh, to find a quack in the United States of America and quacks have uh, fantastic uh, customer feedbacks, so they have loyalty. If you go and interview quacks and their patients, you have loyal patients who will come back to quacks. So it's, it's a fantastic uh, cauldron in which everything coexists. And what we do to these people whom we take in our program is to go and observe problems, because we believe that to solve a problem, you must fall in love with a problem until you feel passionately about it, like we saw during the presentations about the death of a friend, until you are very passionate about a problem, you will not be able to survive, you will not survive the challenges you will face when you will go and start solving the problem. You need to have something 
which will say, okay, this will pass over and uh, all is well, things will change and there will be, everything will be fine one day. So we send these people into the different tiers of healthcare system in the PHCs, CSCs, private hospitals, at AIMS, and they identify a lot of unmet clinical needs uh, running in the range of 200 to 500 in two, three months. Yes, 200 to 300 to 500 unmet clinical needs in a period of three months. And then in a very MBA style way, we start uh, before even the first drawing is made or an idea is discussed, they start uh, doing a validation and try to find out, answer to a question, if this problem were to be solved, will it make commercial sense? Uh, and that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy to arrive at say top five or top three problems that are worth solving. And then we let them think that, okay, let's think through how we can invent solutions for this problem. It's a very, it's a very, very opposite way of problem solving which we learn in our university or a college because there we have an idea first and then we look for a market. So here, this is not an idea that is looking for a market. We find a market first and then invent something because if you do it this way and what our experience over the last uh, almost a decade has taught us, even if your solution is slightly lousy, but if there is a huge market, it will still survive, it will still sell. And then you can always upgrade it, you can always come up with a version 2 and if the version 2 is bad, you can publicly say, oh, it's a beta, don't worry, I'm building the next one. The final one is not yet there. The third phase is the implementation phase and there, which means you have to actually manufacture it. You have to uh, deal with the gorillas like the GE or uh, you have to, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you have to deal with uh, the giants like GEs and the Metronics and the Vipros. You would hope and pray that you get bought by them or acquired by them. Uh, yes, why not? <laughs> there is no harm in, in talking what is true. Or uh, deep within you want to retain your entrepreneurial freedom because once an entrepreneur, it's very difficult to go back to a job because you are your own boss. And it becomes very, very difficult to have almost often a boss whom you will think is not as capable as you are once you are an entrepreneur. And uh, then goes this, 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 this thing that we are the weakest at and uh, I would like to ask all of you and take suggestions is implementation and, and building bridges and partnerships and into manufacturing. So we keep saying that, well, if you want to get electronics done, go to Bangalore. We did for a lot of things. People will say, it will get done in three weeks, it has been three years. Uh, people will say it will get done in half a million dollars, it has already been six million dollars spent. We, we have a lot of talent, what, what Professor Raghavan was saying, and he funds our program, is demographic dividend. We have a lot of people who are tra trained engineers, electronics engineers, who can make hardware. Their quality is not as good, so we are, we are facing challenges in terms of them actually delivering. And very often, and quite shamefully, I must admit that many of our stuff uh, gets made in Europe, gets made in China, gets made in US, we have to go back. And then a very interesting thing which someone was saying, and which is so true, is that when you build something in India and uh, you want to sell it to the government, they ask you, do you have an FDA? It's a shame because India is not the 53rd state of United States of America. Uh, the 53rd card is a joker when you look at the card of uh, pack of cards the 53rd card is a joker we do not need to have fda in our country yes we need to have quality standards and we better figure them out uh, we need to uh, a medical device is considered a drug in our country it's it's regulated by ministry of petroleum and uh, fertilizers with the uh, ministry of pharmaceuticals and that's a shame uh, we need to do something about it what we also did and that's a good news, is that our, this program initially started in partnership with the Stanford University, the IIT Delhi and Ames. And uh, initially people were sent to the Stanford to get trained. What we did was uh, just last year, we flipped the model and we said we have built enough know-how and uh, we can be audacious about it. And we decided that we will invite people from all over the world to come to India and learn here because uh, India has to become uh, what it was in history. It has to grow to a stage where it can train people. And why it is important is again, uh, I was having this a small discussion with, with the person here from GE. 
is I have visited the innovation campuses of the Siemens, the GEs, and the Wipros. What they have done, they have state-of-the-art facility, and I'm not criticizing them in just a point of view, is they have replicated a mini United States of America in their campus. You need to have people who face the hardships and challenges of the real Indians before you have to start thinking of solutions for them. You sit in an air-conditioned room, you cannot walk out of the office if it is hot, uh, you need to have processed food, you need to have a fat paycheck, I, I don't know why it is called fat. I think the numbers are all in one dimension, but it's always called fat and thin. And uh, you are supposed to think frugally and locally. So what we did was we decided that when people, and our network is now growing, so this was the first year when we started inviting students from uh, universities outside these three. And we have students from the QUT in Australia and University of Tokyo in Japan uh, joining us. They have joined and they are, they are facing and they are... It, I see it as a life-changing experience for them when they go and see a PhD. Uh, these Australian students that I have and the Japanese students that I have are in a state of shock when they go to a PhD and they look at a dot center and they look at one doctor doing everything. They say, how is that possible? And I'll run you through a small uh, innovation that I personally have done to showcase and share our story. So the good news is that we were able to flip and become a center of education. And it is interesting that uh, the government of Canada is represented here. And we are trying to have some initiatives to build partnerships in that country as well. And it would be very interesting if you could give us some insights and leads. Uh, we are planning uh, to get students from the University of Cambridge and uh, from Germany also next year, and we are exploring more countries and continents. Now, the bad news has already been shared, which is uh, we have a lot of problems here. Uh, it's any problem, and even Professor Vijay Raghavan was saying that, that we are often on the wrong side of things, corruption, tuberculosis, non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, and which is a good thing. The bad news is actually a good news, because then wherever there is a problem, there is an opportunity. And uh, I would run you through this because what we thought was how do we manufacture in India? Before manufacturing in India, this program is now helping people come and identify problems in India. Because we believe if you identify a problem in India and you do it diligently, it will have an application everywhere because it, it will at least serve some market and it will find a market some, in some part of the world. You need to invent with India because there is abundant talent here. And uh, when people from here can go and uh, become rock stars in Intel, in, in, in NASA, and in everywhere else, uh, why not here? And the last, which we are thinking of and which we have succeeded in doing in some of the products that have come out of our program is implement globally. Because when you invent something with a frugal mindset, uh, it's going to be useful because every country, uh, be it the US, be it the UK, Everyone is dealing with high costs of healthcare, and everyone is thinking of budget cuts. Everyone is thinking of uh, Obamacare, the stop play playing games in NHS, and all these things are just because that they have followed a model of spend more to hopefully become more healthy, which has not worked. So you need to have frugal solutions, which probably can come uh, with a breed of Indians, which I feel are shrinking in number who have a frugal mindset, that I have to do more with less. And I, we still think that we have a subset of population that thinks in that way, who are minimalistic, who don't want to overspend to achieve something, who, who, who want to kind of derive the most out of every, every rupee that they spend. And these are people who, who we think will add value back to the entire world, to not just a healthier India, but to a healthier world. Because we are the ones who believe in Vasudhaiv Kutumbakam, which means we believe that the whole Humanity is but one family. I'll take you to this, and this is, uh, this is what we have an acronym, and uh, Gandhiji is here. So we took this process and we said, okay, we need to have globally appropriate need-driven health innovations, and we, uh, we call it Gandhi, uh, because it has to be need-driven. You cannot just force a solution. And uh, in my uh, limited experience of working with uh, large multinationals, 
uh, one of the approaches that they take, and I do hear a lot about, is defeaturing. So what they will do is, okay, let's we have an ultrasound scanner or a CT scanner which sells well in in US. They will bring a team of people and uh, they'll say, okay, how do we reduce its cost because nobody wants to buy it here at that price? Let's remove features. And I did a very nice uh, experiment with a multinational company, even in the United States. So they had installation of a particular uh, scanner in over 50 facilities. And I just went there. I was on a consulting assignment with them to showcase the features that are needed or not needed. And all that I did was took a phone and took photographs of their consoles. 52 centers, 52 photographs, and 52 slides. And I presented to them without a single word. It just clicked next, next, next 52 times. And then I asked them, what do you see? They said, they are our machines and this and that. Nobody in the room saw that on the console there were 50 plus buttons and only four were being used or being worn out. The other buttons were fresh, brand new, even after two years of uses. And what we wanted to drive the message was, what I wanted to drive the message was, you are adding features just to kind of pump up the price, jack up the price. You're selling it and people are not using it. You better rethink into it. So that's why need driven and globally appropriate, uh, I have already explained. In the last few minutes I'll uh, spend on uh, my personal journey of an innovation. And this came out again of our program. Uh, and we call it Brun, uh, which means uh, in Sanskrit an embryo. And we have again an audacious goal. We want every pregnancy to be monitored. It's a medical device which intends to convert any bed, any normal bed in a PHC or a CHC in a maternal ICU. And I'll tell you through the problem. I hope all of you will agree. And this is, this is my other venture which I call Brun Health where I serve as a human being. My title is human being because they could not find an appropriate uh, title for me. So all of you will agree that the birth of a child is one of the most precious moments in a mother's life. And in India, we have so many of them born. We are a happy nation. We celebrate uh, the birth of children. And most of them are born in rural facilities, and which you cannot ignore. Uh, you don't have many Bombays in our country or many Delhis. You have just one of them. Now look at an interesting thing. The government over the last two decades has succeeded in ensuring high number of institutional deliveries. So there is an incentive mechanism for women to go and deliver into healthcare centers. They have created financial incentives. So if you deliver in a healthcare center, the ASHA worker gets an incentive, the mother gets an incentive, the father gets an incentive. So which means you have a healthcare infrastructure and you are pushing a lot of women into it. Great job. The problem. So we have a huge increase in institutional deliveries. However, the quality of fetal maternal care still needs improvement because we have not increased the number of pediatricians. We have not increased the number of ops gynae practitioners. The so-called news that we celebrate that we are opening new medical colleges mostly are just focused on MBBS doctors. The number of PG seats have not risen so much. And so this is out of a survey of more than 100 hospitals that I personally did. We have infrastructure. We are not augmenting it. We are just sending in more people. So in a rough CHC, which is a community health care center, or equivalent in the private sector, within a period of eight hours and five health care professionals and mind it, all five are not doctors. So you'll be surprised that uh, there could be one doctor on duty and there could be one person who was recruited as a Mali or a driver or a gardener, if you will, and he, he learned how to give injections and became a makeshift compounder or a healthcare assistant. These are five in number. The midwives, the dyes, they deliver 30 babies in eight hours. Now, Delivering babies is not new science. It's known for a long time and what to do with them. And WHO has an established protocol for the last 30 years is that when a mother is admitted, so you are usually admitted with labor pains, which means women, is, women are crying with pain. I'm sorry, I have no experience of it, and I think I cannot have it personally. I cannot cry with labor pains, but I can talk about it. And they are triaged based on risk. When I say risk, our personal experiences showed 
that triage is mostly done on uh, how much the mother is crying, how much of a fuss she is making. The one who cries the more gets the more attention of the doctor because there is just one doctor. And the doctor in, in, in real world is supposed to monitor basic physiological parameters. Uterine contraction, blood pressure, fetal heart rate at defined intervals. Now you can very well imagine 30 beds with 30 pregnant women in labor, one doctor. Is it possible? A doctor taking all these parameters every few minutes and then they are supposed to plot a partograph which is an academic activity which doesn't get done in most of the hospitals. They are supposed to be monitored for 24 hours before discharge. So what was happening is that you have limited number of doctors. You have people coming into a hospital. We looked at it. We looked at the space. We looked at uh, the devices that come from uh, the gorillas in the healthcare industry that they are making. And the usual suspects were the cardiotocographs and the remote uh, monitoring of fetal devices which cost in the tune of 1 lakh, 2 lakh rupees, and hence they cannot be procured in a PHC. The maximum they can spend is 50,000 rupees without a tendering process, which will last months. We invented this, and it is called Brune. And it is very simple. It's a belt, which you can see here on the left bottom side, which anyone can place on the, on the bump of a pregnant woman. And what it does is, after this has been put, it just follows the protocol to just monitor these five physiological parameters and plots automatic partograph on the screen. So that screen that you see is a 10-inch screen, which can even give you a printout. Once we built this, we thought we had built it for the PHCs because this costs less than 50,000 rupees. That was our uh, primary condition because otherwise it cannot be bought by a PHC from their annual contingency budget. Once we built this, we are in the process of completing building this. We, th we said, can this go global? And we went back to United States, we went to the NHS, we went to NICE, and we figured out that, well, they don't need it for their labor rooms, they need it for their homes. They said, we are trying to push as many people, delay as many people from coming to the hospital as much as we can, and we are trying to send them home as early as we can. We don't want uh, people staying in our hospitals, and we are trying to do as much as we can for it. Very interesting, we found a market there. We went to Africa and they said, well, you say you have fewer doctors, we don't have any. So can you just ensure that uh, you put a GSM module inside it? We have the world's best mobile networks because we never built the landline. We, we built, for the first time, we built a mo mobile network and that's why we have the best ones. So we said, okay, why not? Inshallah, let's put a SIM card inside it. We did that. And then they say, okay, what we'll do is in a safe territory where we'll not get, the doctors will not get killed, they can at least monitor and advise the equivalents of the ASHA to do what, what to be done and what not to be done. We have a market there. We went to Singapore and Malaysia. We found markets there. And that's why when we say it's globally appropriate. So this uh, was our journey. And uh, this, this was some feedback that we gathered from around Delhi. And uh, different people had found different value propositions uh, in our innovation. Someone said that I cannot employ so many nurses. I have a small hospital. My profit margins are lower, so probably this device will help us do this. So this is our journey and uh, running a program and uh, building up devices. Uh, I would really like to hear about the implementation phase, which is the most challenging one. Uh, we would like to share our philosophy. If you wish to, you know, kind of, tell people that this is, there is a systematic way of thinking so that you can innovate. We strongly believe innovators are not born. You can be trained to become an innovator. And uh, we think we have been doing that for some time. I ask you to please reach out to me during our lunch and uh, in the day, later in the day, uh, for sharing insights and how we can work together. Uh, it could be somebody who is willing to fund a startup that comes out of our program, uh, willing to spend CSR funding to uh, sponsor 100 of these devices to uh, some PHCs in a particular state or anything else. Uh, I think the world is uh, huge and big and there are a thousand ways of working together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jha. Uh, we'd like to welcome and recognize Dr. Sujata Sonik, Principal Secretary, Public Health Department, Government of Maharashtra. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Gautam Kirtane will like to offer her.
Welcome, ma'am. So I know all of you are, uh, are probably a little tired and a little hungry. So what we're going to do now next is have one presentation by Zone Startups about their incubation space. And then we're going to uh, have uh, Richard and Dr. Sujata speak. And then we're going to have a working lunch. And then we'll do the rest of the presentations in the session afterwards. Does that sound fine to everyone? OK, so Zone Startups, Ankur. Thank you, Siddhant. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ankur. And I represent Zone Startups India. Even before beginning, I'll just uh, mention a quote that uh, ships are very sa uh, safe in the harbor, but, but that's not what ships are made for. And th that's what we basically do. We help uh, startups, which are ships for us. They help, we help them uh, sail through the ocean. And we want to help them sail through really quickly because uh, we feel that if startups uh, need to be successful, they need to be successful really fast. But if uh, they, they are doing something which is not correct, they need to fail really fast. And we help them pivot uh, as they grow through. And uh, we, w we work with basically technology-based startups. Uh, so I'm Ankur Khera, and I'm from Zone Startups India. Uh, Zone Startups India is a joint venture between the Bombay Stock Exchange, uh, uh, BSC Institute Limited, and Ryerson University. Uh, we are uh, at the Bombay Stock Exchange uh, at the 18th floor of the BSC building. So uh, we are basically a joint venture between Ryerson Futures Inc. and the BSC. Uh, we focus on technology-based startups, uh, which are both in uh, enterprise and consumer space. Um, we have been into operations in Toronto for more than uh, five years. We just celebrated our anniversary uh, day before yesterday at the Digital Media Zone. And we started our operations in India around one year back. Uh, and we have been uh, working with more than 43 startups in the last uh, last one year. Uh, I'll, I'll show some stats to you what uh, how things have been moving uh, specifically at the DMZ. Uh, we have worked with uh, more than 70 startups uh, in five years. Uh, some of our success stories are uh, 500 pixels, figure one, uh, Flybits, uh, Soapbox, and Commodore. Uh, two of these companies specifically are in the health domain, and I'll uh, walk you through them as well. Uh, we have been able to create more than 1,500 jobs in less than four years. Uh, this is specifically for the Canadian market, but uh, I'll also share numbers with you how, how we have been um, uh, doing in India. So we have more than 125 innovation centers. Um, this is specific to Ryerson University. We have been uh, running, uh, running labs like uh, 111 uh, uh, and other labs as well. Um, so uh, this is a portfolio of some of the companies that are specifically at the DMZ. Uh, two of them I really want to focus your attention to is figure one. Uh, someone today here mentioned that uh, uh, like we as individuals or doctors or students, uh, they don't get access to journals very quickly or they don't have a habit of going through journals. And that's where Figure One tries to fix this problem. It's an Instagram for doctors. We are taking this, uh, so it's a social network for doctors, students uh, who could basically uh, see the kind of uh, uh, see pictures of diseases and they could communicate and they could share information how how a particular uh, disease is so uh, th th this is one of the company which uh, we have invested in and we are also helping them uh, come to india and we will be helping them ex uh, in their expansion plans in india another company which i would like to focus on is uh, komodo uh, which basically helps uh, uh, it's it's for the disabled. It's a mobile app which helps uh, easy, uh, enable accessibility uh, to the disabled through their mobile hardware. Uh, another company which is not mentioned here, uh, the name of the company is Bionic Labs. It's uh, based off uh, based out of our zone in Toronto, and it's basically uh, they have created a human arm, which is basically a bionic human arm, and it's uh, one of the first uh, one of the first um, in Canada. Today, uh, a few of our companies uh, have, some of our bright companies have pitched today. Uh, one of them is Dimension NXG. Uh, they are a 3D printing uh, uh, solution, uh, specifically focusing on the health segment. Uh, we also have uh, SmartDoc. Uh, Chetanya here is uh, representing it, and uh, he, he, he can tell you more about what they do. 
Um, we also have some of the companies specifically in the health domain, uh, Curofy. Uh, they are basically LinkedIn for doctors. Uh, they are based out of Delhi and they have recently raised a, a round of funding. Uh, and we, 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 we have been working with them closely as well. Events, uh, we, we run hackathons, we run uh, events which are specifically to different, uh, different kind of uh, initiatives. So these are some of the set of companies which we have worked in the last year. Uh, the ones uh, I really want to focus on are Curofy, uh, Dimension Energy, Herald Healthcare, um, uh, Curofy. So all of them are in the health domain. I've already talked about our, uh, uh, the contest which we run annually, the Next Big Idea contest, where we take uh, companies uh, specifically from India and we give them exposure to the North American market. So this is, this is a pool uh, of the companies which we've worked in, uh, 43 startups in last one year. Um, we generally work with companies uh, who have uh, founders who have around four years of experience. Um, the average uh, team size is four members. Um, and we have been able to generate around 216 jobs uh, have been created in the last one year. This is a breakup of the kind of companies we work with. Uh, we are basically in every domain. Um, specifically in health segment I've already uh, talked about. We, we generally like to work with companies in the B2B domain as compared to B2C because uh, we are able to get them a lot of uh, networking opportunities. So this is, uh, this is our team. Uh, I'm Ankur. Um, uh, we at India, we are four members, Ajay Ramasubramaniam, uh, who's the director, who just uh, over there. Uh, Shweta and Tanish, and on our board is uh, Matt Saunders and Alan Lisney, who represent Ryerson Futures Inc., and Ashish uh, Chauhan and Amrish Datta, who are from the Bombay Stock Exchange. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Those of you who didn't know, it is a working lunch. It won't be bad manners if you go ahead and uh, start, because we are a little hard-pressed for time. Uh, His Excellency, the Consul General Richard Bale, is... Uh, scheduled to leave, so we'd like him to say a few words before he does so. Richard. Uh, why what you're doing here today really fits with, it, with our priorities. Um, certainly from an economic uh, point of view, uh, one of the things that, one of the areas which Canada has really start to, started to focus on domestically, but also internationally, is innovation. Um, Canada has and has had tremendous um, uh, innovation strengths. We have a, a very strong engineering sector. We have always developed a lot of um, uh, new ideas, very interesting new ideas, new companies um, in a range of sectors, but, uh, but often in the telecom sector, uh, in the health sector, and in the clean tech sector. And now I'm still one of those old fuddy-duddies that still uses, still is loyal to my BlackBerry, but just to remind you, this is a this is a Canadian invention, a Canadian company that was started by, by one guy. You know, so this was a startup. This is a this is a, a one of Canada's most successful uh, technology uh, startup companies. It's now going back towards startup size, but no, it's going to stabilize soon. Um, we, however, one of the challenges that we have faced is is getting those ideas uh, from. Uh, the idea stage into the marketplace. In other words, converting those ideas into successful companies um, uh, which, which produce products which are then accessible and useful for everybody. This is something, um, uh, there are some, I guess, structural weaknesses in the Canadian economy that make that uh, um, uh, difficult to happen. And therefore, we have, over the last number of years, placed a tremendous, uh, uh, made tremendous investments in the uh, incubation and accelerator uh, segment. Um, now the presentation you just had from Zone Startups, Zone Startups was established by uh, Ryan University in, in Toronto. Uh, it's, Ryerson is the university in Canada which has c uh, made the strongest commitment to the incubation sector. Their, their, their incubator in, in Toronto is extremely successful, extremely well known, called the Digital Media Zone, and they are now starting to export that model. So that's why Zone Startups is here. Um, this is their uh, prototype export model, right? And more are coming in other countries. 
So when I see, when I hear that they have incubated 43 Indian companies, these are Indian companies, not Canadian companies, in one year, that's pretty impressive. That's very successful. And uh, now we have a whole range of, in fact, I can't keep up with them. Uh, Sri, my colleague, I think, knows what, uh, what all our incubators are in Canada. But there are so many now, and, and, and they're doing so well. Uh, Communitech is one in Waterloo. Waterloo is a technology center where the BlackBerry um, uh, was started up. Uh, we have one a very well-known health, um, uh, health sector incubator uh, called Mars in Toronto. Um, and, um, and what we, in, a, in addition to doing, um, making these investments in incubators in Canada, we are now starting to try and, and ourselves as a government, um, help bring uh, Canadian startups to markets such as India and, and companies from those um, markets so such as India back to Canada through a new mechanism which we have uh, developed called the, uh, we call it the CTA, the Canadian Technology Accelerator. My colleague Sri here, if you can just wave your hand. Did you speak before already today? No, okay. Um, uh, we have um, already done the first phase of that. We brought half a dozen uh, Canadian companies here. We took half a dozen Indian companies to Canada. Uh, it, it's been extremely successful. There's a, one or two Indian, two Indian companies that, as a result of that, are in the process of establishing uh, operations in Canada. Uh, there's a second phase that's coming um, this year, and anybody can apply, right? So anybody can apply. That's three. Um, so that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing on the innovation side. And so that's a big priority of. And I guess what you might call our, in domestically, our economic policy and internationally, our, our economic diplomacy. Now, when you move over to the, let's say, the development, uh, our development policy, around the world, Canada's single um, highest priority is um, maternal and newborn child health. So all around the world, uh, Canada is pouring money into this area. Um, and I'm glad I'm late because that meant I, I was able to, I, I say I, I came a little bit late this morning, but I'm glad I came late because otherwise I wouldn't have read the message that I just got on my BlackBerry, which is, um, I'm sure as you know, Prime Minister Modi is in Canada this week. And I don't know if, um, if was Grand Challenges spoken about earlier this morning? Okay. Well, there was a, <coughs> I got this copy of a press release on my BlackBerry. <clears throat> which says that um, Canada and India jointly announced today, um, so this is Grand Challenges Canada, funded by the government of Canada, and the Grand Challenges India initiative of the Department of Biotechnology, who, and who was, they were here earlier today? Um, yes. Yes? By Skype. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by Skype, okay. We today announced an investment of $2.5 million in five health innovations in India. Many of these projects aim to improve maternal, newborn, newborn and child health, which is Canada's flagship development priority and a tremendous challenge for the government of India. So, so here we're, you know, we're, in India we're putting our money where our mouth is in terms of uh, health innovation. So from these, both, both these sides, from the kind of the innovation side and then from the health side, um, uh, Canada, I'm here to tell you that Canada is a very big supporter of making things happen um, in India. We're also, and I'm very glad to see the Principal Secretary Health here, we also, we are supporting some uh, projects in India, in, in Western India, including in Maharashtra, um, working on, um, in the health sector through, through the system of ASHAs. Um, and we're very, we've, we have a small projects fund and, and these are not projects we implement ourselves, but we accept applications on a competitive basis from, from um, India-based NGOs. And, and there's one in particular here in Maharashtra that we're, we're very uh, pleased with in the health sector. So with that, that kind of explains why we, we're here and why we're very keen to work with um, our good partners, ORF, on this particular initiative. And, uh, on that note, I wish you uh, luck with your continued deliberations during the day. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Consul General. Uh, Dr. Sonic will uh, has a brief presentation she'd like to share with us. Sujata Sonic, Principal Secretary, Public Health and Family Welfare. I'm very happy to be here to share some of the thoughts about what innovation and technology can do in uh, the health sector. Uh, Maharashtra, as you know, is one of the large states of India. And uh, we have a huge, not only a geographical area, but also a very large population to, to cater to. So for the last several years, uh, this department has been looking at technological solutions to uh, ensure that there is some uh, a sense of all the data that is being collected uh, every day. Um, for example, in the infant mortality rate, uh, we collect data against 50 parameters. So that's the scale of information that is available. The problem is that this data usually doesn't get analyzed in a manner that you can dovetail your policy and your, uh, you know, your uh, initiatives or your focus areas to match with the requirements in the field. So that's a huge challenge in this department. It's also a very large department in terms of personnel. So just keeping track of all the people who are working for us is also a huge challenge. So some initiatives we have taken recently, and we have been fortunate enough to win some awards at national level. Um, the first thing is we have something called e aushadi which is... Uh, uh, electronic supply chain management and monitoring system. It uh, lets us know uh, what is the availability of drugs uh, in each of our units. And uh, it also allows you to analyze trends of disease outbreaks and to uh, monitor availability of the requisite drugs in those areas. Um, there is a facility also to check uh, what drugs are being issued to the patient and whether um, those drugs are matching the diagnosis. So it gives you um, the possibility to intervene at various levels to make uh, course corrections and uh, also improve upon your standard treatment protocols to ensure that whatever uh, treatment line is being followed in the field, you can sit and monitor it here from the uh, headquarter, and you can also ensure that those treatment protocols are improved over a period of time. Uh, we have been also looking at several um, e-health initiatives and now moving towards m-health initiatives. So as part of our e-health initiative, we had started something called the telemedicine program, uh, wherein remote areas of the state are connected uh, through telemedicine to uh, major hospitals in Mumbai, where the uh, expert doctors can give advice uh, after looking at the documents, the case papers of the patients, sometimes we find very unusual cases coming up in the remote and tribal areas. And these people can get a direct interface with an expert in Mumbai uh, and uh, take uh, a proper line of treatment. And there can be follow-up done also through that. So that's another very interesting project that we have been running. Uh, we are now moving towards maintenance of electronic patient records so that we can do a better profiling. We are using GIS maps and looking at block level, village level data to see what kind of outbreaks of diseases have come up in the recent past and what, whether the drug supply uh, matches the requirement in the field and how we can better manage it. We need not over uh, sort of procure and we need not waste drugs simply keeping them in stock just because um, you know you get a feedback from somewhere that this much uh, drug is required. We want to match it with the actual outbreak of incidents uh, in every uh, block. So that kind of GIS uh, detailed mapping uh, work is going on right now, and it is leading to some wonderful <laughs> results. Um, the, it's work in progress. It's not something that's over yet, but it's something which is um, going on. We, we have taken a couple of other initiatives. We do a video conference every, uh, every Monday. The whole state is connected, and sometimes this is done with Delhi also. So Government of India, Ministry of Health, people also join us. And a person who is working in the field can have a direct interface with officials sitting in Delhi, giving them feedback from the field. This kind of uh, exchange of information and monitoring and review is helping a lot, not only in building confidence, but allowing people to give you information which is direct and very fresh, and also giving you a chance to mention important issues which you need to convey immediately to a large audience in one go. So, you know, technology definitely helps over here. 
And uh, lastly, I would say that we are starting a, something called the pull SMS system, where a daily information of how many live births, how many surgeries performed, how many uh, OPD patients have come, how many inpatients are there, all that information is collected. And at a click of a button, it is available to uh, everybody who's working in the department. Now, I would just uh, in, um, you know, ask uh, you to bear with me for a very small presentation that I want to make. I had prepared this actually as part of my talk here. And then I thought that I could, uh, I could just make briefly mention it uh, so that uh, you get a fair idea of what kind of drug procurement we are doing. Yeah. All right. So uh, very quickly, uh, going through this, um, you know, what is the pharmaceutical sector in Maharashtra like at the moment? So uh, almost 32% of Indian pharmaceutical market is in Maharashtra. Almost all major companies are here. Uh, it's home to about 347 bulk drug units, 693 formulation units, and various other manufacturing units. And uh, 171 units approved by the WHO, Good Manufacturing Practices Guideline, and 10 units which are approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. Now, what are the factors for of, uh, the success of this industry in Maharashtra? First is the infrastructure. Second is the access to good labor. And third, the government policies have been, by and large, very uh, conducive to setting up of these units. You know, you can have this presentation if some of you are more interested, because I'm going to go through it very fast. So um, what kind of biomedical equipment and instrument sector exists in Maharashtra? It's, it is a key player in biomedical equipment and medical devices manufacturing. We have 14 in Maharashtra. Uh, some of the names are given here, including Philips Healthcare. And IIT Mumbai has been doing a lot of research with the private sector to design and manufacture low-cost diagnostic equipments. And also, there is collaboration of educational institutions of Mumbai and the US to conduct research towards creating high-quality and low-cost diagnostic devices. We have a very interesting episode. You know, there is something called Embrace. It's a baby warmer. And that has been developed by uh, uh, students uh, from the IIT who had gone to the US uh, and they developed it as part of their um, um, uh, study project. And uh, today, it is available in the market. It's a very low-cost solution to transporting neonatal or new newborn babies. And uh, we in the department also use Embrace a lot. So if you look at just what are we procuring, because procurement is one major activity of the department. So almost 48% of the medicines produced, procured by uh, public health department, 14 came from Maharashtra. So this is the pie chart, which is pretty, uh, I mean, um, self-explanatory. Uh, outside of Maharashtra, we are buying a lot of drugs from Himachal Pradesh. And then, of course, there is Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. Now, these are, these are some of the current innovations in healthcare. IIT Mumbai, again, in collaboration, has brought out something called UCheck. It's a mobile-based urine and blood glucose analysis system. It's low cost, efficient, very error proof and um, works on most of the commercially available urine test strips. And we have something called SuCheck, which is a low-cost glucometer. And uh, its mobile app saves trend and an analyze blood glucose levels at an individual level or track response to treatment at a community level also. Challenges, even though there is access to good labor, there is um, government policy encouraging um, pharmaceutical industry in Maharashtra, still there is uh, high land and labor costs. Uh, I, I would also add there's a lot of unionism here, which uh, there's high electricity cost. One of the things in Maharashtra which we keep hearing from various sectors that uh, electricity costs are very high compared to some of the other countries. And then uh, we have also high dependence on China for importing of raw materials um, and uh, time-consuming bureaucratic procedures. You would have already heard that the industry department of Maharashtra is working on simplification of the entire process of setting up new industries. And uh, I think that has gone quite far ahead. The new government is very committed to it. And very low government expenditure on infrastructure, uh, especially in telecommunications and road infrastructure. Um, so there are good practices in other states and countries which we could look at, perhaps. And there are opportunities available for make in Maharashtra. Uh, and we also, as a department, as a major client, we are looking at these things. Um, uh, and that is why all this study has actually been done. So thank you so much for giving me a patient hearing. Thank you, Mr. Kulkarni, for giving me a chance to come and talk to you. I apologize for a late arrival. 
I was caught up in some other important things. Uh, and I'll be very happy to hear from some of you uh, in case you would like to have any dialogue uh, on what are the possible areas of cooperation that we can have in, in, in the public health department. Thanks once again. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I hope all of you are enjoying your lunch. While you're eating, we're going to have one more innovator, Medovator, present his uh, idea, and then we're going to open it up to discussion. By then, hopefully, you would have made your way through dessert. Uh, hi, my name is Chaitanya, and I'm the founder of Superdoc. Uh, in the audience, uh, I would like to see a show of hands. How many entrepreneurs in the in the audience? Show of hands. Of you, how many people have worked with entrepreneurs? Okay, so uh, if you are an entrepreneur, or you worked with an entrepreneur, or if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, this is something that you will like. Uh, so continuing, uh, Superdoc is a smartphone app that helps doctors and patients connect over a smartphone network. So I'm going to start by telling you our story. So Abhishek and me uh, were in the US. Abhishek studied from NYU and I studied from GW. Uh, and we were both in Washington DC and New York. And uh, we thought we should come back to India and do something for the people, right? So we were bouncing off ideas and then we decided, you know, why not try and provide affordable medicines to the masses, right? So cheaper generic alternatives are available for the masses, but people don't know much about it. So we thought, you know, why not get there and help them do that? So that's what we did. We came back to India and started Dava.in. Uh, what Dava.in did was it provided cheaper alternatives to expensive drugs. Uh, it did medicine home delivery and it gave daily medicine reminders. So these were the problems we faced. Now the Pharmaceutical Act of India is from 1948 and we are living in the 21st century with internet and smartphones. So no phone was invented and uh, ordering medicines and delivery was very ambiguous, right? And at that approximate time, uh, the FDA started mandating, so this rule already existed, but the FDA started mandating that a pharmacist be there at the counter. So they started creating problem in drug delivery as well. Uh, now, for those of you all that don't know, AIOCD is a lobby of druggists and chemists, and they told us that you are not allowed to give any discounts whatsoever. Uh, so that went out of the way. Uh, and as we gave medicine reminders for patients, uh, you know, this cost was very close to us. But the TRAI came in and the regulation changed saying that the cost of SMS will go up from 1 paisa to 20 paisa. Uh, and the final nail in the coffin, the national pricing policy of India, what they did was they suddenly reduced the prices of 348 essential drugs. So in a period of six months, if you see, there are five regulations that have completely changed, changing the face of our business. Now the question is, if someone wants to start a business in India, right, how can they plan? How can someone make an Excel sheet when the regulatory environment is so unstable? I think this is one of the biggest reasons why people do not invest in India and why people do not stand start businesses in India. So I wanted to start by that. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move forward and talk about what we're doing right now. Uh, so in India, for every one doctor, there are 1,700 patients. Uh, in, in rural area, the statistics are even worse. Uh, for every one doctor, there are 2,400 patients. The WHO recommends that there should be 300 doctors for each patient. So there's a projected shortage of 600,000 doctors. Lack of patient education. The patient awareness is very, very low in India. Uh, sexual health issues are a big taboo. Now, lack of health education leads to poor health outcomes. What is the Superdoc app? The Superdoc app is the easiest way to get health information from top doctors. Do doctor consultations remotely with a smartphone. Ask anonymous sexual health questions. 
features so uh, patients can discover doctors according to area specialty or rating uh, they can get relevant health tips from the best doctors they can do remote phone consultations and ask anonymous questions and patients can share health tips and spread health and wellness in the community we started from the belief that doctors treat patients in their clinics but what could they do outside the clinics to spread health and wellness in their community in when we're in the age of mobile i think that you know they should doctors should go forward and try and spread health and wellness in their community so we did a pilot with 100 doctors and 4000 patients we got an amazing 66% engagement with doctors and a 46 47% engagement with patients what we realized was that doctors uh, wanted to spread their brand name and wanted to help patients as well and patients did not have the form factor to get specific education that was beneficial to their health now the question is uh, how can the government help right so we see all our laws are generally reactive versus proactive you know and there are so many knee jerk reactions here so for example all of us know the uber case here right so a woman gets raped in a uber cab and they ban all radio cabs so a simple question anyone would ask is couldn't that have happened in a regular cab so is banning the solution right uh, one more thing i would like to say is all the laws that we have at least most of them have been made in an age that none of us connect with right it's it's the 21st century a 1948 or a 1927 act does not really make sense in the present term and the last point i'd like to put forward is that why are we changing regulation on such a regular basis that no one can plan business here so this is my appeal to the government uh, if you have any questions uh, please do shoot an email to chaitanya@superdoc.co uh, thank you so much for your time Our last uh, meditator is someone who's waited patiently all day for this. Dr. Nitin Kale is going to present on nano sniff. A very good afternoon to all of you. I am Nitin Kale from Nanostiff Technologies at IIT Bombay. Uh, we were incubated at IIT Bombay in 2011, and we work in the area of uh, micro electromechanical systems for chemicals and biosensing applications. <coughs> so, in this, uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about uh, our company. Uh, we are uh, making these. Uh, uh, microelectromechanical system devices essentially for two applications. First is we are trying to build an explosives detector and second is an infarction sensor and a little bit about uh, patents and other things with uh, nanostar. <coughs> so we are a fabless company so we don't have our own uh, fab but we use some of the fabs in India uh, founded by Professor Angupal Rao, Professor Shomi Mukherjee, Kapil and myself. We focus on nanotech uh, sensors based product. Uh, we do the sensor design and nano fabrication ourselves. Uh, we also work for coatings, that is modifying the surfaces of certain devices. We do microfluidics, a little bit of my biochemical processing. Uh, for Dr. Jha, we have a strong team of which does you know embedded systems, hardware, software, code design. So we write all our device drivers. <coughs> Uh, we uh, just to uh, add two more points. We were funded by the Department of Biotechnology by a BIRAC grant, and we were also funded by Grand Challenges Canada for for you know making a, uh, a device or actually showing the proof of concept that we can detect cardiac markers with our instrument. 
Yeah, so first thing, nanoscan, which is a handheld explosives detector that we are developing. So the problem is very well known. Uh, an explosion because of uh, IED, for example, can happen, or RDX or TNT. Now the issue is that detecting explosives is very difficult. You cannot smell it. And therefore, you need to have some kind of a nose which is electronic and which is highly sensitive. So this is something that we are building. The waiver pressure is low. You know, signatures are not available. So these are some of the very important issues in detecting explosives in the vapor or the trace phase. <clears throat> so we need uh, a selective and sensitive method to detect explosives. You know, there should not be a lot of fal false alarms or you have a huge queue at the airport or a cinema hall, everyone, you know, is giving a false beep. So the value proposition is to have a high sensitivity and a highly selective, low deployment cost explosives detector. So the key technology here is we make micro heaters. So this is a MEMS device. What you can see here is that the width of this particular heater is only 10 micrometers. 100 microns is the diameter of the human hair, a tenth of that. And this is very reliably manufactured, so you can make hundreds, thousands, as many as you want. Uh, this can rapidly heat up. So in a couple of milliseconds, you can go to 500 degrees Celsius. And the very innate property of an explosive, which is to explode, is actually exploited here. So you rapidly heat it. There is an explosion. There is a built-in sensor which detects a small change because of the explosion. And then it becomes a you know, actual instrument. And so we also make the instrument uh, that is going to drive uh, this particular device. So there has to be a pump, or there has to be some way to heat or create vapors. There has to be a temperature measurement or a resistor measurement. This everything is done by the, the electronics that is built in. So we go through you know, all these uh, processes, which are typically used in uh, making the chips that go, for example, into our cell phones. The other thing is uh, iSense, that is infarction sensor trying to detect cardiac markers which are released in the blood after a person has a heart attack. Uh, this is within, we are looking at early cardiac markers so that a person who has a chest pain goes to the doctor. The doctor is not very clear. Uh, there is a non-ST, uh, you know, that ECG elevation and the doctor is not, uh, wants to make a decision. So this is something that help, that can help the doctor in doing that. So the principle here is that we again make uh, a MEMS device, which is called as a micro cantilever. The thickness is very less. It is less than one micrometer. Therefore, you have a large surface to volume ratio. You can do a lot of uh, bio reactions there or biomolecule interactions there and cause certain <coughs> mechanical movements. <coughs> so we are looking at detecting certain early cardiac markers, for example, heart fatty acid binding protein or the very uh, high sensitive troponin kind of uh, uh, kind of proteins. So the solution definitely is to have a, sorry, a smart instrument that will be highly sensitive, highly selective, and can be done, uh, can do a rapid diagnosis at a very low cost. So again, we are looking at the public healthcare system in Maharashtra or in India or in African country where this can be deployed. So what we do is we make these micro cantilevers. You can see here, this is that particular device. This is less than a micron thick and it's about 80 micrometers in width, about 200 microns in length. We immobilize antibodies specific to the particular cardiac marker that we are looking at. In the presence of that marker in the sample, it's going to bend, cause a change in resistance of this particular film. And the electronics that we have built, which again measures the resistance continuously, is going to give a change. So with the help of the GCC grant and the BIRA grant, we have shown a proof of concept. And now we are going to the next scale. We have been funded by GITA <coughs> to take it to the next scale so that we can do hospital trials. Uh, we, have, uh, we were transferred a couple of uh, patents from IIT Bombay. And we have filed patents for the explosive detector. Uh, we are in the process of filing patent for the infarction sensor. Uh, what we look at is, uh, as a talk of internet, the next phase is the Internet of Things, where uh, everybody is monitored, every place is monitored. So all these sensors can actually go into those places, and you have a huge network. So there is a huge opportunity, as we see in the medical and healthcare systems, and the security and uh, uh, surveillance areas. Uh, these are some of the other stuff that we are making. So for example, these cantilevers can help teach student MEMS, or these microheaters can also help teach student MEMS. So we have made uh, certain instruments with which people can perform experiments. 
Uh, this is another device, for example, for teaching students how to work in the area of MEMS with microheaters. Uh, our basic philosophy is, uh, you know, for coming from the pasture squadron, uh, where you have uh, the knowledge utilization and the knowledge creation as two important uh, coordinates. Uh, we are trying to do things here where we use, where we do user or the use case scenario based uh, inspired basic research rather than someone like Edison who did 40,000 experiments to get that particular tungsten filaments or pure basic research which is some luxury that we cannot really afford to do. So there are a couple of other things which I like to speak about in the next session in which uh, we can talk of discussions. For example, <coughs> Uh, to make our devices, we need fabs. We don't have anyone in India, and we don't see fabs coming in the next couple of years in India. So we have to go to Taiwan. So there are a lot of things uh, that are going to help our case. We have a good case for making all these products, but some of the things have to come in India so that, you know, that make an India dream can be realized. Uh, so that's all. Thank you for your time and attention. Thanks to invite, thanks to giving me an opportunity to speak here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Kale. We'll take a short five-minute intermission, uh, intermission after which we have a company dialing in from Canada to talk about their experiences in the innovation space. So five minutes uh, intermission, and then we're back here. I'm just going to give a short two, three-minute speech about um, what iCheck is and what we do. So my name is Daxel Desai, and I'm one of the two co-founders of iCheck iCheck is a low-cost vision screening solution, and our solution is a smartphone application that can screen for vision impairment it, without the need for any additional hardware add-ons. Based on age group, we can screen for diseases like cataracts and reading glass prescriptions, among other factors. This allows us to pres provide a prescription to anyone, anywhere, in just two pictures iCheck was founded by two engineering graduates of University of Waterloo in collaboration with the School of Optometry in September 2014. In six months, we have expanded to a team of six and conducted our first field trials in India. In addition, we're supported by a panel of five expert optometrists, both in clinical practice and academic research. Just this year in February, we with a local charity, we have been able to test our technology in the field. In early 2015, we visited the Sundarban region of West Bengal in order to test our early versions of the smartphone application. We were able to observe how an efficient charity runs their operation and where there's room for improvement. In the Sundarbans, we observed firsthand that our technology is not only helpful, but that it is demanded. And with the data we brought back, we're working towards FDA and CE approval. And we're back in India in June for second round of beta testing. And we're ready to launch in six months. And these are some of the pictures um, typically that we took at, it, at an eye camp and the optometrist that we worked with. In June, we're looking to set up a panel of expert optometrists in India to act as our champions. Second, we're looking to expand our test locations for our technology to include fixed clinics. And last, we're looking to build a local testing team in each area of our fixed clinic as well. And from the policy level, we're looking to engage key stakeholders under the NRHM branch particularly the NPCB and the RBSK programs. And these activities will allow us to allow us to become closer to preventing blindness. And none of that is possible if people cannot see clearly. An eye check is the first crucial step towards eliminating preventable blindness worldwide. Eye check, take a picture, save your sight. Thank you. Discussing who got where and how and despite what or in spite of what. And uh, Dux has a great example of that. So if you have any questions for him, you can uh, use the microphone or ask for a microphone. If you don't have one, Shomli there has a microphone. Uh, and 
we can get started, and then we can start talking about the observations you've made during the course of the day when uh, the other companies were presenting. So anything for uh, Daxal in Toronto? Yes. Daxal, there's a question coming your way. Hi, this is uh, to check. Uh, can you provide us a little more details about the technology? Uh, what's the uniqueness of the technology that you have uh, in the smartphone app? Sure. So the idea is the, I mean, the current existing solutions require bulky and expensive equipment. And the technology that we're using is really simple. Essentially, we're analyzing the red reflexes that, uh, from the retina that bounce back when the light is shined into the eye. So where our you know, latest camera applications try to prevent red eye from occurring, we actually want the red eye to occur. And the, really, the, the brains behind our um, smartphone application is our image processing algorithms that can analyze that red reflex. And based on the red reflex, it can detect the um, eye power or other opacities in the eye like that can be a result of a cataract or a glaucoma. Uh, Rashan, quick question. How different is it from iNetra? Because they use a uh, smartphone, they have a device which captures diffraction, reflection. How different are you from iNetra? Mm -hmm. So iNetra is working towards their second generational device. Um, so originally they started off with this little add-on that sticks onto a smartphone. Um, they've, they quickly found through their user testing that the the device they had wasn't user-friendly because it required inputs from the patient themselves to come up with their own prescription. So they're working on a second generational device. Um, the big difference between iNitra and us, so their second generation device compared to us, is that we can screen from a meter away and that allows us to screen children whereas they have to place their device on top of literally touching someone's face, um, which, uh, which marginalizes that entire age group. Okay. Any more questions for iTrack? All right, thank you very much, Daxal, uh, for your presentation. No. You have a good night. No. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having me. All right, so now we are finally opening up this uh, session that was supposed to start earlier in the day. If you see on your agendas, we are on page two, stakeholder discussion, 12.45 p.m. Uh, we're sort of behind that. Supporting grassroots innovation, policy issues, challenges in the regulatory process, ideas and solutions for change in existing policy, and the government roadmap for future of innovation in Maharashtra and India. So let's take innovators' experiences. We've all heard the companies present today, and we've heard about how they got here. How about we have some of the innovators tell us, and some of the people who haven't spoken today, I know Dr. Chogli and Bhavesh had, had some points to make earlier in the day, and uh, Akhil and Pradeep, about the challenges the companies they see who don't make it. Or oh, many of us happen to be serial entrepreneurs, and they've had companies that have failed. I know Chaitanya, for a fact, was telling me about Dava.in, which ran into regulatory issues. So let's, let's start with that. Uh, Chaitanya, you want to get the ball rolling? Talk about Dava.in. Should do something that would benefit Indians. The unique case that we thought about was, you know, we all we all have parents who have taken great care of us. Imagine if someone were so poor that when their parent was in pain, they could not give them the medicines that were there to give them that relief. So, you know, that would take away a man's dignity. And we thought we should go ahead and change that, right? So it's not that, that medicines are completely unaffordable. If generic alternatives were to be given, uh, a lot of poor people would have that option of care and relief. So we started with that point. We quit our jobs and we came here. But as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, either the lack of clarity in regulation or the constantly changing nature of regulation uh, really did not, 
you know suit us uh, in the journey per se and you know india has a multitude of problems like there are so many lobbies right so government regulation or the lack of it or the ambiguity in it along with strong lobbies uh, you know uh, made us not do something good so uh, i think the world bank report for doing business uh, ranks india uh, below 150 in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation right so if for example you are someone in a foreign country who was thinking of investing in india right how do you make an excel sheet where all the regulations change right so we need to we need to put one thing up front that you know let's just change the laws for the better and let's not keep on changing them so i'm going to start by saying that uh, i don't think <coughs> any business you can do forget about only one business where these kind of regulatory issues are there a five year excel sheet really works all under guess all under risks and someone makes it so you can't expect someone to freeze everything for you as an ecosystem it is going to continue to evolve react and also oppose now i wanted to understand in your business model dava.in were you thinking of a logistic support or were you thinking of subsidizing so basically our plan of action was uh, that we thought that we ourselves couldn't be able to deliver medicines uh, on a mass scale so the way we thought about this was that uh, we will generate a lead uh, to chemists who would deliver the medicines so for example uh, if you had a condition and you googled it or if you googled our a uh, medicine you know all the information and it's still live would be available on the website and if you would like to change uh, say if you would like to get a cheaper alternative with the click of a button you would get the information available uh, and you would uh, order it according to a pin code and a lead would be generated to of a chemist shop uh, in your locality who would go and deliver it to you so our basic revenue model was in the long run we thought we'd be we'd make more money out of the data as compared to the medicines itself i think all pains in business can become stepping stones i think you have given up uh, your hopes uh, in an sms era you didn't wait until whatsapp era came in a whatsapp if somebody scans their prescription pad and gives to you it's a legitimate business you have to deliver and no law can stop you so i think the concept is good sms is uh, not reliable because uh, anybody can sms but i think whatsapp was bought for 19 billion uh, only because it had some hidden strengths uh, which could be of great commercial tomorrow and you must reinvent mm -hmm. don't give up come back this is my advice uh, thank you for your support dr velmi so i have one more thing to ask and probably we all can discuss around it is when you talk of regulations uh, it's very interesting that uh, when you're trying to sell something in the healthcare space you're not governed by one nation you're governed by as many nations as many states we have uh, health often is a kind of state subject did you consider that before you did come here and did you did you think that okay can i choose a ut or choose a small state and do a pilot and try or how did you go about rolling it uh, we thought of starting from the nariman point area there are a lot of offices and very few chemists so we thought we'll start from the nariman point area and then branch out go go throughout mumbai we'd actually partnered with a few small chemist chains out here but suddenly the fda uh, started uh, you know cramping on home deliveries because they said the chemist is supposed to do the home delivery and the law is very gray in this area so we did have a focus strategy of how we you know concentrate on a specific area in mumbai then okay. spread throughout mumbai and but our partners who did the delivery completely backed off because of the fda crack on pharmacists not doing the delivery but the delivery boys doing the delivery so that was a big challenge for us so the rule says uh, delivery by cannot deliver 
Uh, the rule is in 1948. Uh, there is no clarity. It does not say uh, that a pharmacist cannot deliver. I mean, a delivery boy cannot deliver. It does not say a pharmacist has to deliver. The gray areas are the problem. You know, if the rule would have said a yes or a no, it's a binary decision. You know, we'd follow it. But so the gray areas are the problem. So mail order pharmacy is not possible. You cannot mail a box of uh, medicines. At, a, at scale, it will be a challenge. The second thing is uh, there's a lobby called the AIOCD, yes. which protects, which claims to protect retailers as well as distributors. What they basically mandate is a certain distributor can only give medicines in his area, and chemists cannot advertise discounts. Now there is no rule that says that, right? But hey, if you do that, no one's going to partner with you. Because they are a really strong lobby. Yeah, it's, really too strong. It's, it's not possible. And hey, it's not even illegal. If I advertise a discount, that is not illegal. If I distribute in different parts of Bombay, you know, that's not illegal. But the AIOCD will not allow me to do that. I have a small suggestion. The office bearers can be given some equity. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, why don't you partner with them? Why don't you? Why, why are you fighting them? Why don't you just partner with them? <laughs> you know, Chaitanya, you talked in your presentation of policy changes happening. So, quick, very honest question to you: Did you start this company for valuation? What was your objective and end goal? Uh, so, basically, uh, what I believe is that you should, it, you no, need not have one goal. Right. No, what was your primary goal? I mean, so uh, simple. I, I'll, I'll simply tell you my primary Dr. goal in one sentence. Uh, I wanted to build a great company that helps people and makes a lot of money for me. Okay. So my only suggestion hmm. is build companies for sustainable business in the long term. Today's generation, I'm, I'm not being derogatory of them because there are enough case studies. Everybody is building companies for valuation exit. You cannot build large sustainable businesses and here's a man sitting next to you 17 years doc 17 years if you know his story you'll be amazed that he's sitting here you have to take take our our erstwhile chairman 50 years rajan he built his company built brick by brick to build value for the country so if and today's generation there are a lot of them youngsters here build companies for value build sustainable businesses Build profitable businesses, try not to live off investor money, they will come chasing you. Yeah.
if you have not done enough of research on what the potential risks could be and have not had countermeasures planned right from the beginning, that's one of the root causes of most of the failures that happen. Uh, the amount of time that is spent in most of the, let's say, successful companies in anticipating and planning for risks in the ventures, I think that's really the key uh, success factor. Maybe I would uh, like to add to you, and I would agree. If you look at uh, one of the points that you said which led to the failure was regulation on the prices of essential drugs, and if you look at its history, that was five years in making. That did not happen overnight. So I think uh, one very important thing when you are starting up is the due diligence, uh, which is the most important thing I would say, because it's very nice to have an idea and fall in love with it and say, I'm going to do it, and then suddenly you are blinded by everything else. No, I think this will take care of itself. Things don't take care of themselves. And especially that particular risk that you mentioned, that was not, that was not done overnight. That was, that was a white paper in circulation for four and a half years, five years. So probably you missed it. Yeah, or probably someone may not have predicted that this would come out in five years, ten years. Yes, 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 agreed. So always, I think hindsight 2020, that's what they say, right? <laughs> yes. So that's how I like success also, it is never first, I thought hindsight. Can you know the one good thing about our country? All businesses have survived despite government. Yes, I know, absolutely. Okay, so as an entrepreneur, you have to factor in those things into your point. Answer, answer one more point. Don't start anything at Marimun point. Our office better than sitting here on you. They will clap it before you take part. I, I think that is a very nice <laughs> segue to the grassroots innovations. And so, to, to add, add to the, your point, what I thought was there's a guy who was sitting at Marimun point, and this is a guy who is trying to sell them generics. These guys are not that. that why do they go to coffee with my friends? They have a time and go over it. The money. And they have money also. I must admit, and this is uh, off this, but if I prescribe a generic to one of some of my rich patients, they will they do not get cured. Let me admit it. They will say this is a cheap medicine. It will not it will not help me. So you go and watch the movie Anand, and there are two characters over there: a grassroots doctor and a top tier doctor and there are different market segments in the business world and there are different market segments and we need to cater to them differently. Yeah. Agree. Agree. <laughs> and why not uh, segue into supporting grassroots innovations and uh, discussion around it. So, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, please feel free to jump in uh, and, and add your points. Dr. Cha is now our yeah. unofficial official moderator. This, uh, this really has nothing to do with your business or business model. But just, if I may pass on some experience, this generics and specifics of pharma is actually a bit of a minefield. Uh, I, I know doctors who swear that when they switch to generics, patients died. Because the quality control in generics is, is a question. And uh, so, I mean, assuming that you want to do good for your patient, be, you need to be careful. I'm, I'm not uh, taking the side of the big pharma. But I'm just saying it's a bit of a minefield, so you need to look at that. Uh, just to add on to this before we go to any other thing, I mean, sorry to be constantly talking on the same. Uh, I have spent about 15 years in pharma. And uh, with due respect to what you said that, yes, there is a minefield. There are still very, very good companies who are into generics. And it makes a lot of sense to be selective. Don't put, I mean, don't try to put the entire ORG IMS data into your database you will land in trouble but go selective and even today he said whatsapp but there are many other ways by which this can become a reality the part of equity what he was saying there are ways of doing this in partnership with people who matter in AIOCD and you can make it a success we can really discuss on this this can be successful and you have to be selective in therapy areas selective in company selective in therapy area this can be successful uh, can exactly I make a point? I was saying, by the way, I Sorry. was not supporting this thing. Generics, but just be careful. Absolutely. You agree? All, all these points make a lot of sense. You know, certain things we learned before starting the business, and we learned a lot of things after starting the business, right? So, like any other first time entrepreneur, 90% only after Absolutely. I think we all learned about marriage like that, so. <laughs> Based on the KP mass, 
again and again the same statement came up. That is the same thing. Where, I mean, in US, in Silicon Valley, you open a company, you fail, you get a better job as such. Yeah. Here you fail, the Indian side, you get a better job. That goes to a schooling system. Yeah, yeah. even neither Since the discussion that of topic today is uh, low cost, high impact yeah. innovation, I'd like to draw your attention to something very interesting in this room. If you look at that infographic over there, it talks about per capita healthcare spending for different countries compared. And if you want to see where is India, India is that fourth smallest dot somewhere after Bangladesh, Pakistan, the next comes India. We spend about $100 per capita public health spending. Compared to that, with a large bubble which doesn't even fit on the screen, that's the US. It's about $8,500 per capita income. Uh, again, I mean, so which direction are we heading? Uh, just recently, about a couple of weeks back, the Indian government slashed the public healthcare spending by 20%. And that news did not make it to the front page. It was somewhere a small note, you know. And the worst part of all is that there was no voice from the medical fraternity speaking up against it. Why is it happening? So, you know, and any discussion on low cost and high impact cannot be done without talking about primary care. And it's not rocket science. You know, we talk a lot about innovation, technology, wearable devices, big data. But do we have the basics right? I mean, all across the world it has been seen that the greatest advances in life expectancy are, are not a result of high-tech innovations. They are a result of very basic measures like water supply, sanitation, good primary care. However, what we are seeing in our country is that the policy framework is in the favor of the tertiary and the secondary segment. We have a push from the hospital lobby asking for equalization of UG and PG seats. And if it were to be that way, all doctors graduating from medical colleges are going to be specialists. And you can imagine what is going to happen to the healthcare system if that happens. I mean, and I mean, there's no debate about what models of healthcare systems should we actually adopt in order to bring the cost low and you know, increase the affordability and accessibility. A good model to be looked at is the Cuban healthcare model, which revolves around family medicine, where the spending is about $200 per capita, where all their healthcare metrics are better than the US. But sadly, in our country, what we are seeing is you know, entirely the opposite, a push towards more investigations, defensive medicine, laboratory medicine, at the expense of family medicine and primary care. So I'd like to just initiate this debate. I would love to hear from the audience. What is your thoughts on that? What could we do you know, as the healthcare community, both the you know, uh, technology, medical education? How can we push the government to actually bring the focus on primary care? Yes, thank you. Uh, you just struck the target because that's exactly what I was thinking all the time. We all are talking technology, innovation, and all this. But let's, as he said, we spend less than 2% of our GDP on healthcare. And where is it spent? It's spent on people who are already diseased. Where is it uh, going, all the money? And it's going in urban area. The rural is, rural India is really suffering, as you said. There are primary health centers. I go to a village once a week. Once a month, every Sunday to this Adivasi village, the primary health center doesn't have anything. I take medicine and all. People walk 60 to 70 kilometers with having lung problems to just take theophylline, which is the cheapest drug. I can't give them more than theophylline and salbutamol. They come there. The day if I say, you're all right, I'm going to cut, they cry. They say, please give me that medicine because it must be making the improvement by 20%, right? Now, uh, you see, we already have centers in all the big cities and all small cities. We have medical colleges. What has government done to these medical colleges? It's not improved the infrastructure of the medical colleges. They are, in fact, going down. No teachers are there. Students are taught badly. You know, we all are saying that India is going to grow, India is going to, but China is going to beat us because our medical education is going down. You know, so we have to think, can we use technology in all this sphere. And I think there is an answer. Dr. Lele and I have been talking about it for last 
three to four years. You know, government does collect data, as Dr. Uh, Sujata, health, the health uh, secretary said, they collect data. Where is it? Do they know what exactly is happening? It, to analyze that data, they analyze it after four years. The data four years back, they analyze after four years, what's the use? Isn't it? So you, you need... You, you need find the data on the health statistics website in the form of a scanned PDF. Exactly. Which you cannot even download, you no, can do I'll, nothing I'll with give, it. I'll give you an Some example. Some of the data is so outdated, in fact, you see... No, but you I'll know, tell you why. I'll the, tell you why. We have a hands-on experience. Bhavesh and I, um, and he knows about it, and he was the one who did not support us over there. They, you know, the BMC, BMC said, we want to know how many people are having a sputum positive. Can you make a software for us? We said, okay, we'll make it. We made the software. With a one click, they would have got the data, and only BMC did not have to enter the data. The data would have been entered at, suppose it went to ThyroCare, and he found, he already, you already collect the data, right? Name of the patient, who's a referring doctor. Exactly, everything in close. All we had to capture from there, the data, and the laboratory tells us positive, negative. That data goes immediately to the BMC, okay? Immediately the same, same particular day. And data entry is done at that level and they already do it. We said we'll just incorporate in it. So government would have got a data of how many people were positive. Immediately, every day in the morning. So the, the data which I need to see as a D ward, I see. He needs to see as a state government, he sees. This has taken us three years to have gone through the Lena, three years. Now, one simple thing is all the TB patients Come seventy percent come to the private hospitals, private doctors. Thirty percent goes to BMC. The data which you are hearing about TB is only from half data from ten percent of the people. What we said, look, he said, Dr. Chaugle sent this patient. He captures that that referred by Dr. Chaugle. So BMC could immediately write to me, and same arm could tell us that look, this is the data. Your patient, tell us a detail, isn't it? This simple thing, technology can help. And you know, another thing is, government, that 2%, government can spend by simple technology, they can spend and give good quality. You know, there is a need for good quality healthcare. And government can do that. Dr. Lele and I, we have this vision that we say, you know, government has mother and child, it has immunization, it has before prenatal, postnatal, all kinds of thing, programs. One person is registered in 20 places. What we are saying is create one electric health record for each and single Indian who's there. And whoever has to write, suppose he comes to me, I write everything in there. He comes to you, you write in there. And the government then gets the whole data. He comes for investigations, that there is a number, he puts it in there. Each one of us will be doing then the government will get the information. So this is what is required. This is a need of the R to get to electronically collect all the data and then analyze it immediately, not after two, three years. I can actually put that in the Aadhaar card. <laughs> no, you can link it to the Aadhaar card. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so if I can... <laughs> Sorry. Suppose you're diabetic, okay, I'm the insurance company, and I say, okay, you're diabetic, if you maintain your blood sugar within normal limit and show it to me in this health record, I will reduce your premium. If the insurance company does that, you will take this and you will declare that you are diabetic. And it is important to keep your blood sugar normal, right? But give incentive, you know what, why this is not picking up? The main reason why it's not, there is no incentive for, look what Obama did. First four years, he told all the doctors, 
if you save all the elect your records electronically, I will give you 40% reduction in your tax. Told 17 million to the hospital if you if you store it. After four years, he said, done, everybody has to do it, no more giving any incentive. That incentive procedure made people store the record. And let me tell you, I'm a doctor. We are bad at recording. We are very, very bad. We do not like to write. We say we want to see patient, I've got 20 patients, 30 patients. Take some minute. And that's what we have to cultivate. And that only government can cultivate. Give incentive to the hospital, give incentive to doctors, they will do it. So, so the basic problem, I mean I come from Dasra and we work with so we work with a lot of NGOs who use technology um, for health purposes. And the biggest problem is that NGOs like government don't fundamentally understand technology and vice versa, technology companies do not understand NGOs or government and the areas they work in. We speak two different languages and it's very difficult for both to understand each other. So there's a fundamental uh, point of divergence there. The second biggest problem is that though technology is extremely, looks extremely scalable, it only works and it's only low, low cost when you reach a large number of people simultaneously. Because back-end, creating the back-end, having the infrastructure is extremely expensive. And if you look at all the technology pilots that have been done with the government or without them, they are all extremely small scale. And India is sort of known as the graveyard of innovative pilots, where pilots come to die, basically. So, there is some fundamental reason why even uh, programs that have got good results have shown positive improvements in health outcomes have not been able to grow and fundamentally it's because the two parties cannot understand each other. That's, you're absolutely right but the thing is what we do is we take software which is worked in Canada, America and all. We don't look at our logic. We don't make a logic for ourselves. Now the NGO should be making, now we are making a software for an NGO. They want 1,000 fields to be filled by the field workers. Now, uh, Bhavish is saying they don't have, they have two G. Bhavish, tell them about this. I mean, it's a classical case where you have doctors trained in the US who are coming, we are coming back here to help the Indians, poor Indians. And what do they want? A software which has all the fields. This is what is mandated in the US. They don't realize that you are going to a small village in Maharashtra. The person who's going to take that data is not, it's just a nurse because of the designation given. No training. How is that person going to fill that up? But no, I need everything. I need the WHO chart, I need the Indian chart. So what is that person going to do? And they expect this guy to then go and also train the mothers. Maybe I'd like to you know, bring the attention of being very different, right? I personally have visited more than 200 PhDs and interviewed the doctors in charge. Most of them have complained that we are no more doctors. We are managers. Our job is to run these multiple number of national programs on IOD and, and this and reforming. We don't see patients, we don't have time for it because we have to create a report. One. And that is a paradox because you cannot have decisions that are not evidence-based. You cannot allocate resources without evidence. If you are innovating anything in our country and you are doing a business modeling and you want data for anything, you will not have it. Even if you go to the McKinsey or Deloitte, they will hire a research associate who will do some random Google searches in PubMed, look up with some data here and there and collate it and say, okay, let's extrapolate. <laughs> That's rubbish. Number two, uh, how, do we, how do we still, and, and third thing, I'd like to bring a news, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of it, that the government of India very silently has launched something called the National Health Portal. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of it. Yeah. And uh, it has existed for the last five months now. It was done in November. And uh, it, is, it is like an RSS feed of every app that exists and you can just put your app there and it goes there. We are not yet sure how these so many, grave, uh, so many dead bodies in the graveyard of innovation are <laughs> going to float around over there and what we are going to do with it. But I strongly believe that we should discuss how we can bring in evidence-based decision-making on healthcare allocation. And I think uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Lele to give his opinion because he has been working on this. Uh, Dr. Lele and <coughs> health intelligence and data-driven decision-making. Oh, yes. Thank you. In, 
In 2011, I visited Taiwan. Taiwan has a population of 23 million. Each Taiwanese has his own health card. He goes to his family doctor. He reads his entire history and all the drugs. He goes to a hospital. So when I came back, we decided that Mumbai, Thane, and Navi Mumbai together are 23 million. So we plan that in the next 48 months, Mumbai should have a health plan. Taiwan is making losses because they have not added preventive care. So I'm going to do one step further. Unless you add preventive care, health insurance makes losses. Do you know this? All health insurance companies in India today are making losses of 15,000 crores, and they give 6% of the TPO. So how stupid are the insurance companies not to understand that unless you add preventive care, health insurance is going to be lost. So my main feature of Mission Mumbai Health is every family in Mumbai, poor family, bronze card, middle class family, silver card, rich family, gold card. What is the common feature? Preventive care for each one of them, electronic health record for each one of them, and a preventive care by a family physician. And all this can happen in the next 48 months. She is ready with the electronic health record. We are so frustrated that we are not making progress, but still we are optimist. At the age of 88, I'm an old man in a hurry. I don't make five-year plans. <laughs> 12 months plan. So I am looking for a microfinancer. We did a survey of Dharavi. The poor man in Dharavi, in one week's illness, becomes a bankrupt. So he's eager for my plan. So what is my plan? The entire family of five gets life insurance for the breadwinner, accident cover for all. Today, you have got a chance of being knocked down by a truck when you cross. So every Mission Mumbai Health person will have an accident cover and pension above the age of 60. This one, Kevin Bhatnagar, who is a pension expert, who is joining me. So for the first time, Mission Mumbai Health will have preventive care, health insurance, a family pension, and a pension above 60. It is not a pipe dream. I am looking for a microfinancer. The moment I get a microfinancer, my scheme will be ready. So wish us good luck, and let us be very optimistic. One simple plan. Every year, 30 million children are born in this country with a birth weight less than 2.5 grams. A birth weight less than 2.5 grams is the insurance that when this child becomes age of 40, he gets diabetes, hypertension, and heart attack. So how easy it is to prevent every mother's nutrition to make sure that no child is born with a birth weight less than 2.5 grams. Can there be something more simpler than this? So if you can ensure this, that no child will be born in India with a birth weight less than 2.5 grams, in the next 25 years, the whole picture will change. How easy it is to be done. Now, 30 million Indians die of iron deficiency anemia. I had given a simple proposition. All of you have got Teflon uh, Tawas. So give iron kadhi and iron tawa. Yes. If you got iron kadhi and iron tawa, and your food is made in that, it contains enough iron. Doesn't need a Nobel Prize. But for five years I've been telling that give a newly married couple an iron tawa and iron kadhi <laughs> for the rest of their life, they will have iron source. Because it is simple, nobody wants to listen to it. Karipata. <laughs> so I am ending on a very optimistic note that things are very simple, and because they are simple, we ignore it. So please let us be very optimistic. Mission Mumbai Health by the year 2015 should become reality with all your blessings. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Thank you, sir. I, just want to, oh, sorry. I just want to make a comment. I think coming to that, uh, we don't celebrate failure. But the moment you mentioned failure, we all jumped on him, right? So that's, that's our culture. That hats off to Chaitanya that he brought here. You're here and talked about your failure, which is very, very interesting. So if you don't encourage, in, even in this room, you won't be coming next time. So that's what I think uh, a learning for us. Yeah. No, no, absolutely, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but initially it was a bombarding, right? It was a bombarding. So. No, no. So we never, no, nobody congratulated him. I think uh, we were not bombarding him. We were telling him to restart. 
No, that's fine. But 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 did we congratulate them, right, for him coming? We're on this topic. What I'd like to say is that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Check the net. Don't need. So that's point. I just want to make a point. Just one, just one second. Uh, what we do right now is we, we're launching the SuperDoc app. It helps doctors and patients connect over a smartphone network Talk where doctors can spread health and wellness in their community and patients can ask questions. So we've moved on to our next venture and we're doing reasonably well at it. You like should call yourself a serial entrepreneur. So that's what we mentioned, right? US people call. And in Bangalore, that's a problem. People go, you know, remove their LinkedIn profile. So your failure, you cannot even trace them. After a year, you'll be surprised when some company will think <laughs> So, I think coming back to the grassroots innovation, I think the point uh, you raised about preventive is very, very important. We are just moving into the tertiary side. Look at, uh, as uh, you mentioned, that uh, health healthcare expenses is one of the major reasons the poor are poor or not able to come out of it. But what are we losing? Uh, there is an initiative in Tanjavur. Uh, by Sugawaru, by the Nashville board, if you know him. So he was trying to address three problems. Right? One was about uh, lack of doctors in rural areas, because we have uh, not many. So he created a program with some university in the US. He brought the uh, Ayush doctors, gave them a six months of training, got them certified to do allopathy. And then he started the initiative with the technology. Right? When any, uh, Portion walking in, collecting around 100 data. So it's very interesting today a farmer in a village, Alangudi, has a cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes. I'm sure all of us, we do a health check. What are the first thing the guy, doctor says? Go for a one hour walk. This farmer working for eight hours in a farm, where is this cholesterol? Right? So this is where you know the data is helping, trying to figure out the lifestyle change. It's no longer a thali that he eats with this two vegetables and sambar or some and curd. He has this much rice with the curd and pickle. So that is what changing, right? So what's happening? The basic input, what, what the nutrition, what we're consuming is completely changing. What are we eating? What are we wearing? Everything is completely gone. So what are we eating angle, right? In the village I see, where every village I see, the word beats me is a garbage. In the garbage I see boost. There is an argument that people used to drink in the villages, right? Now we have Sachin comes and says, Boost is the secret of my energy, and you drink Boost. So, no developed country in Boost, right? Ask people, anybody drinks Harvest in the US? Not at all. So, what we have done, right? The lifestyle has changed. We made the people, even they are poor, we aspire them to drink Bonvita and Boost, Kampla and to grow bigger, and all which is not required. But nobody is going to come to an advertisement on millets. Nobody is going to do advertisement how good the ragi is because there is no business around it. But I think that is where we have an ability. If we can fix that one, where before it comes to a treasury becoming, becoming a lifestyle issues, then we are going back to do that, right? So that is where other element that's coming is about the organic farming. Right? So I was in Punjab last month. Right? Today, the, one of the high income state struggling on cancer. The milk has contaminated you know, minerals in it. I could not believe because, uh, so now they're selling their lands to treatment for cancer. So the water has mercury and nitrogen, and then you have your, we all go to the bottled waters, but what happened to livestock? They're all drinking the contaminated water. The milk comes with this nitrogen in it, right? So this is where I think uh, uh, one element is looking at the health angle from this element. So once it's happened, what do we do? But we have a plenty of opportunities to do today to do the right thing. I like this book, what he has done on homeopathy and modern medicine, which is where probably we should look at is a fusion model, right? Where we have seen an owner for investment in Bangalore called Ayurveda, and many of the chronic diseases like diabetes are completely cured by Ayurveda. And so he has some integrated thing and he's able to bring in that where and all Ayurveda has strength, let's utilize that. Wherever we need to have a modern medicine, because modern medicine is all about measurements, right? We measure and then act. Ayurveda is all about you consume and then see what happens to you in two months, three months, and all the process, which is able to do that part of it. So can we do the fusion element of it, which will bring down the cost of it? Because 
I, like the book he has written, there is somebody written in Tamil recently, comparing Siddha. And in Siddha, all the chemicals, right, what is coming out of those plants, he is comparing with the modern medicine where the chemical is in your tablets. He is telling that the, what we consider as a weed in our neighborhood, it has all these elements. So which is bringing back people eating dosa with kila nali and some of these local herbals, which is what we've lost from the lifestyle element of it, right? So this is something for us to probably think about. Yeah. Uh, just one little comment. Ayurveda, there is a lot of measurement. We have forgotten how to make those measurements. I mean, there were Ayurveda earlier who would do this five or six thing of this pulse thing and they'll say also, that, that was measurement. In some way, we don't, we are not able to do that. That's a different story. Uh, so, um, and, but uh, one thing that, uh, what, the, what Dr. Yeah. Mashalkar said, that one thing what Dr. Mashalkar said uh, about quite a few years back, uh, I mean, these uh, Ayurveda, the medicines are like uh, that uh, Gandamadan mountain. Uh, it is the whole tree uh, or the whole leaf. Uh, the active ingredients are isolated for the Western medicine. The Ayurveda gives you the whole tree. So now uh, there is a There's just a point, you know. Uh, I'm think, thinking about the way he presented it with uh, the fact that he never forgot the profit motive and the way Dr. Lele talked essentially of the social motive. Uh, and I think it is described that a lot of these things we have to prove that the social motive can be cost effective and it should be run in a cost effective manner. So I think where you, with your experience in management and people like you can come in, is to help Dr. Lele do his social initiative in a cost-effective manner. Then we don't have to rely on the government for anything. Let me give you a story. See, we have this controversy about tobacco these days. And everybody says the tobacco farmer will go out of job if you uh, prevent the sales of tobacco. There is a move in Karnataka now, and I know because I'm closely associated with people who are there. I'm not personally on the panel. What they're doing is, uh, they asked the government whether you can take over. And the government and the health uh, minister was a very smart person. He said, see, this tobacco industry is a private party. You are asking us to unlock the private party and come into that space. We are not equipped financially or otherwise to do it. So what they did was they went to Ayurvedic formulary companies and said the same uh, land, plant an Ayurvedic herb. You can sell it for twice the amount. The farmer now where he used to get 100 rupees is getting 500 rupees. Now these are the kind of innovative models. See, innovations need not be machines. You know, you can have innovative processes. You know that there are many types of innovations. So this is where actually the managers can come in. Unfortunately, managers right now are only pandering to corporates. They are not looking at how you can apply. You know, he's talking about microfinancing. You have the Nobel Prize winner from Bangladesh who got them. You know, it is. Uh, let me put it like that. It's a done deal. We have everything in India. We are just unable to put it together because we don't think big. I think one of the reasons why everybody is enthused about Modi, and I'm not being political here, is he's thinking big. We are all thinking small. We are all thinking, make this item, make this item, make it, make it big, make it make money, go retire, and as he said, sell it off to GE and, you know, <laughs> take, take your panel. We are not thinking big. Uh, yeah, I want to add on that uh, this is very important, the preventive aspect as well as what you rightly said, the integration across these various fields. We have to remember that this compartmentalization is uh, man-made. Yeah. So not only across, you know, disciplines of, uh, you know, the ways of practicing medicine, but also within medicine, all the various disciplines that you have. How it's Man, woman, man, woman, and human made. Yeah. So the essential, huge made. So the essential problem is that, you know, we do not have uh, enough openness to look at things that are across disciplines, to look at things where, to look at the bridges across various things. As you rightly said, that you know, we have the expertise on the management side, the finance side, the technology as well as the, you know, the people who are going to implement. But the linkages between those are accidental. Yeah, it is only person made, you know, we bump into each other, we happen to do something. We must have ways in which uh, people who are looking for, let's say, a technology, people who are offering a solution or wanting to do good in a certain way, keeping business angles in mind, can 
you know, approach a certain, you know, sort of network or forum. That is where there would be a, you know, platform for scaling this up. Otherwise, it will remain, do I know you? Do I meet you? And what can the two of us to do together? To scale that up, we must have these kinds of, you know, platforms that have to be created. But when it comes to collectively, we do not want to exactly, do things collectively. Exactly. So, so that's why we are, not, we are not growing as big as we should be growing. Yeah. Because a scientist will sit in the science lab. I, as a medical person, you know, I'll yeah. give an example. We had, I, I wanted to do, I did a study on asthma. And I wanted to know environment, what was environment. Nobody was ready to help me. I had to go to BRC. That's the time I met BRC scientists, and together we have started an institute, Indian Institute of Environmental Medicine, where we study, um, you know, heavy metals in Ayurvedic medicine and things like that. There are a lot of things which we do. But, you know, what is happening is that, as you said, you have a, a special, you know, you're good at something, I'm good at something. We do not, we do not want to come together. That's our problem over here, not because we don't, don't have. No, no, that is, that, is, that is also one problem. But there's also a problem in even if you want to, it's a question of, you know, sort of a trial and error. You know, it can be a little more systematic than that. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, but our, uh, see, the other thing is, See, let me tell you, the networking, another big problem in the networking, our networking is compartmentalized. So, you know, an orthopedic surgeon will network with an orthopedic surgeon. No, that's not what you need. You need across disciplines if you want to, you know, solve the bigger problems and let them scale on. You don't meet the different kinds of people. Even this kind of an audience is very rare. as well as uh, local, uh, the medical colleges, as well as the local medical research uh, institutes. Uh, there are some uh, private organizations involved. There are NGOs involved. And for that matter, there are some accelerators involved also. Uh, so putting all these things together, hopefully something is good is going to come out. At least we have a space where engineers and, do and so doctors are actually talking. Also, oh, just uh, put IT Bombay Healthcare so Consortium right So the point the is that, you know, this healthcare consortium is a, you know, starting point, but it's a baby step. One has to realize that the importance of these kinds of activities and to, you know, try to spread these. Because uh, that healthcare consortium has happened because of a few people's ideas and then, you know, again, bringing together certain people of different disciplines. The good thing about the IIT system is that it gives you that flexibility. So, which is why it tolerates mad people like us <laughs> who don't have any one discipline. But at the same time, these are the things that can make a difference if you can help, you know, uh, have a little bit of institutionalization to this process. And I hope, you know, this ORF, you know, the, our uh, interest in coming to this meeting is that I hope that you can make a little bit of an acceleration on some of these areas. Yeah? Okay. ORF. You know, I think the main theme was probably the prioritization of low-cost, high-impact medical and health innovation, especially with the parlance of Make in India campaign, which the not-so-new government anymore now has launched. You know, the challenge is that, I mean, I represent a medical equipment company, and uh, in India also we had started a project called ICFC, In Country for Country, which has now been re-termed as Super Value Technology. And uh, we have developed some about 24 product, 24 medical equipment, if I can term it as, uh, under this program. And the latest one has been a CT machine, CT equipment, uh, which we have launched on 1st of April this month. And uh, this is the biggest uh, medical equipment which has been actually conceptualized, designed, and now being manufactured in India by GE. Mike, you know, I, I am not a technology person, I am not an engineer, neither a doctor, but I primarily work with the government. That is my experience all my life, you know. So my question here is that we come up with, uh, because government is the major provider of health in the country. Government has the mandate to provide health care. I mean, we are sitting in a city like Bombay. We don't have the, uh, I mean, 
quite a lot of us definitely have an exposure, but not many of us have that kind of an exposure where we can, you know, relate ourselves with the conditions. Uh, let's say in even probably maybe 200 kilometers from Bombay or 100 kilometers from Bombay, for that matter. Now, my concern is that we have got policies, you know, as far as government policies are concerned. We have got a complete infrastructure from the healthcare point of view. We have got a PHC, we have got a CHC, we have got district hospitals, tertiary hospitals. And we have got even listed down that what a PHC should have as far as equipment are concerned. What a CHC should have as far as equipment are concerned. Everything is there on papers, no doubt about it. But trust me, where is the implementation? The biggest question mark is the implementation. And that is my concern. Today, we have developed right from a mobile ECG to, uh, let's say, a CT equipment. But with the lack of regulation in the space of medical devices, you know, a fly-by-night operator comes, sells an equipment, and goes away in a tier two or a tier three city, where there is no accountability of that seller as to who will maintain the machine, who will be able to, you know. And a lot of these equipment which are being sold in India, they are not even allowed to be sold in their manufacturing country itself. So there is no regulation per se. Today the medical, the Drugs and Cosmetics Amendment Bill 2014, is uh, rather 2013, sorry, is lying in the parliament to be presented. I mean, two parliament sessions have passed by November and March, but nothing has actually moved on. So the point is that I'll rather appeal to ORF here that being a think tank, you know, they should actually take input from the industry, maybe people like you, and then develop some kind of a white paper which needs to be taken with the government. That these are the challenges as far as the implementation of your policies are concerned. How can we improve on these challenges? So that we can actually make our healthcare system more effective. And as the gentleman had rightly mentioned, from the primary healthcare point of view, I think if we can address the primary healthcare challenges, trust me, the load on the district hospitals and the tertiary uh, hospitals will automatically come down. So today we, I mean, and that concept of NHS, the UK based NHS where the GP has completely died down in India. There is no family doctor which we used to see in movies in 70s and you know, late, uh, where he would know everything about your family members. That concept, because even in urban cities, we as individuals would not like to go just to an MBBS doctor. That's the kind of mindset we have developed. We want to go to a super specialist, yes. I mean, we actually check the degrees of the doctor before we go to him. So this is the, I think these are the areas if we can probably uh, address, look at, I think a uh, lot of these disease burdens and a uh, lot of these issues can be addressed by these things. Uh, you know, if you look at the cost of death in the Western countries, the total, if, if, if the country is spending 100 rupees, say for example, 100 dollars, if you look at the cost of death, which is in sustaining life, they spend $20. In sustaining or preventing death in the last few days of life, you spend the another 60 or 40. And uh, even America now, if you look at uh, a recent NEJM article, it's now saying that we lost the crown jewel, which is the NHS and the primary physicians. The beauty is that the MBBS curriculum was found on a Britisher's recommendation, uh, the Bhore Committee, which says that the, the ideal of creating a MBBS education system is that you are creating family doctors. And if only they want to become, they become a specialist. And as you rightly said, you know, we are our primary physicians in India now, everyone sitting in this room. You have a headache, you decide you want to go to a neurologist, a nephrologist, a cardiologist, and you just show up. And I think that is one policy decision that can happen is that a, card, a, a specialist can only see patients like it happens elsewhere, that only can see patients when it is referred or the patient is referred. If you go with a headache to a cardiologist, they will ask you for a TMT. If you go with a headache to a nephrologist, he would ask you for a KFT. They are so biased by their education mostly or to prevent or, or whatever me the reason, it's not great uh, for them to raise corruption in medicine, they would, uh, they would ask you for a battery. And go and get this executive panel package done and then, and they're losing clinical skills. In India, doctors are losing clinical skills. Uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I was in med school, we would be taught uh, 
to diagnose with a stethoscope and with my hand with the pulse and with these things. Nowadays, if there is a problem, if there is an abdominal pain, go for an ultrasound. I will not do an abdominal examination. And, and that's, that's sad. Uh, absolutely right. You know, we have a software which also enables you how to take history taking, teaching. So we said, let's go to all medical colleges. Do you know the dean of the medical college said, Dr. Chaugle, only 15 days my uh, students will be using your software for history taking. So why should I pay you that, that much amount and why should I take it? So if the dean of the medical college is saying history taking is only for 15 days, We've lost the plot, you know, and we all are go we all are very proud to say that India is going to produce best doctors they used to produce. Now, no longer China is going to beat us. We will be no more exporters of good doctors to the world because China is going all the way back, educating their undergraduates how to take history, how to examine, how to do that, which India is not doing it. So we have to get up sometimes on it. I just want to digress a bit um, from the sessions that we've heard. I've heard a couple of problems. There's no collaboration between doctors. There's no collaboration between pharmacies. Two, there is policy changes happening without catching us unaware. There's no people helping us validate. Chaitanya, if somebody had guided you on, you know, this is perhaps the wrong way to do it, or perhaps these are policies which will come against you, you would not have made those mistakes knowingly. So I'm suggesting, uh, since, the, 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 since there's a forum to also get positive, I'm suggesting that ORF actually look at perhaps creating a healthcare innovation ecosystem, which involves practitioners, academicians, because there's a lot of IP sitting in, in, our, in our colleges in India. A lot of IP. Entrepreneurs, government, and investors. Create a healthcare SEZ. I'm calling it, for lack of a better word, a healthcare SEZ where you can validate, an entrepreneur can come in, the system, that is how I think you can institutionalize innovation in a vertical. <coughs> Government has done it beautifully in, in post-independence, BHEL, BEL, the manufacturing was, was verticalized that way. And this is a suggestion, I mean, there are doctors here, there are investors here, there are entrepreneurs here, there are academicians here, there's a lot of passion, can we channelize that and don't take the government as a lead. Yeah. It, it, it could be perhaps a PPP, like it happened in, in Karnataka, Bangalore, the, for the first PPP where infrastructure happened and it ended up so beautifully. So, suggestion, I mean, if you can just... Sir, so one more thing, right? oh, please, please. Yeah. I've been waiting desperately, controlling my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I'll not take much time, also I'll say so. Uh, uh, sir has rightly said, we said suggestions. In my slide also I said the same thing. It's just that we have put some simple words because we were thinking there will be some great people sitting over here. Exactly same. We said platform. We said uh, 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 there should be protocol ecosystem. and ecosystem. That's what we said. But we said let's not make it very jar jargon wa wa wala thing and let's keep it simple because of our age sort of thing. But that thing, Madam has read the issue. I was getting so eager to talk at that point of time just because I knew somebody goes to some level, it goes to, go to another level. So I wanted to join them, Madam, because exactly what they said. Now one more point I would like to highlight at this point of time is this professor from IIT Bombay sitting over here and then they're saying that they have formed the consortium at this point of time. So my, my, my question uh, is because since I stay in the hospital, government hospital, my wife is a doctor. So what happens is, uh, <laughs> one few incidents that will <laughs> highlight the things. Quarters, quarters. <laughs> so in and out, and I stay with only doctors. They, din bhar baate karte, bhar mein ko, they only talk, hardly they talk for five minutes for some other issues. Then they like this, some medicine and some case and all. I mean, I'm like, I, I'm, 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 I'm an engineer. I don't understand anything out of it. So I try to gra grasp something out of it from an engineer point of view. <laughs> Okay, so, so this kind of one incidence I, I would like to highlight is uh, there's a shortage of medicine in AIDS. And my wife was sitting and thinking a lot, what has happened, patients are crying, they're coming and then they're raising their voices. We are helpless, that guy is also helpless who brings the medicine and all. I said, if such kind of issues you face, where do you go? She said me, we just go to our dean or the hospital, that, uh, that guy. And he's also aware about that. That issue has been raised by that pharmacist who hates it to that guy, but nothing has happened. 
So such kind of issues which I have faced, this is one thing. This is nothing to do with this thing, but I, I, I just personally seen that thing because these AIDS, AIDS guys, you know, they come once in a month and they, they don't get medicine and something like that. And it has happened everywhere. And the reason when I, when I, I put in my thought, I went, uh, went outside and talked to many uh, hospitals, they said that contract is over. I said, what the hell is it? Where are the systems? We talk of all e-governance. Simple, your operational issues hai, you get it right. Why do you need e-thing e for it? First get it on right on paper, uh, at least operationally. This was my, this was my experience. And I'm really delighted that uh, whatever, whatever thoughts I thought about, that I, I just come from a serial entrepreneur, exactly my thoughts from people from IIT. And then exactly the same thing, because I feel we are, we are way too late. Because if institution like IIT, the best institution, are trying to take some actions on the line of consortium, then we are very late. We should act fast. And we would, I would urge everyone who has got access to medical colleges to start something of this. And I would start with very simple things, as Mr. Lele said. I generally think of very, very simple, simple things. So simple thing being consortium things to be a very broad concept and all something. So let's hope for it. But at least every medical colleges that you have access to and deans, which we find difficult to deal with. So if you can just please those guys or tell those guys, at least have one hour in your hospital wherein all these stakeholders who are interested, we will come to your place. That's not an issue. No egos, nothing like that. And as Madam has rightly said, um, Madam might differ. I differ from Madam's view that there are some DNA issues of we not conflicting egos and all. So new, new generation doesn't have those kind of egos that but new generation want to deal with it. That's not an issue. We don't, we don't mind anything. So, so it doesn't matter. You know, good scientist, good engineer, good, good businessman, they come, they come along. And we, we will come together. We'll go to the hospital. That's what we said, there should be some protocol. Tell me the time when JG hospital is open, I go to the cases. Sir has rightly said you should have gone to some people who is an insider, but where will he go? My question is where will he go? He doesn't, have, he doesn't know which, which timing and which place to go. Yeah, I'd like to respond to uh, your suggestion as well as John. You know, there's a great suggestion, uh, platform a consortium for doctors and interdisciplinary thinkers to come together. And you know, we've actually been working on similar lines. So I am also the lead evangelist for uh, the Health Entrepreneurs Network for Thai, the, the Indus Entrepreneurs. Uh, so just beginning of the, this year, we, we launched this uh, network. We have about 400 healthcare entrepreneurs just in Mumbai. And we had a couple of events. The first event, in fact, we had Dr. Velumani as one of the keynote speakers, a very inspiring talk by him. And just last week, we had another uh, discussion on technology as a, uh, an enabler for healthcare. We had about five cool startups come and share their ideas. Now, besides that, I've also been working with uh, a couple of medical associations. One of them is the IMA and the Association of Medical Consultants. And here is a challenge that I have faced in bringing you know, doctors and entrepreneurs and you know, thinkers together on the same platform. And I would put all the owners the blame on doctors. You know, so we are very tough nuts to cracks. So we have big, big EOs. So just to give you an example, uh, I uh, uh, so the AMC wanted to hold an um, event uh, at KEM, a mentorship program for young doctors. And one of the suggestions I gave to them is, why you know, there's this really nice social entrepreneurs from IIT. You know, they have a really good startup. They have set up 10 healthcare centers. Why don't you invite them to speak to the young doctors so that they would be inspired? And the response was, are they doctors? He said, no. I said, no, then we don't want them. Our doctors will complex a complex, inferiority complex. They are not doing anything, and somebody else is you know, setting up a center. And they had a very strict criteria. The only speakers have to be alumni from that very medical college. So you know, it's a, the medical fraternity, you know, we are a closed community. We don't really, yeah. <laughs> So, so now, uh, so, so no, so I'm not just presenting a problem. I'll also analyze it. You know, I'll, I'll let you know because I've been. You know, this is one of my areas I'm very passionate about. I've been trying to understand why we doctors are like that. Why are we so closed? Why are we not open to suggestions? And it's all to be blamed to the medical education system, the process that we go through, the environment that we work in in medical colleges. Very strict hierarchy. You're supposed to look upon your senior. You can't question them. Always living under fear. You know, that stifles our creativity. When I was a medical student, I started off being you know, a creative person, a poet, a writer. Five years of medical education completely destroyed me. <laughs> and it, luckily, I had an opportunity to go to the US. You know, I, I studied a whole lot of new things. So that gave me a fresh perspective so that I could come back to India. And now, you know, after having worked with some of medical education, you know, having struggled, I figured probably the best way of going forward is you know, to set up, build your own road. 
So we set up this innovation lab, you know, through my organization, Vishwas, where we are trying to be facilitators, you know, bringing together the medical associations, entrepreneurial community, holding small events, going to medical colleges, conducting debates, information sessions, interest groups. And this seems to be working. You know, it's going to take some time. Uh, but then at a policy level, what I think the government can do is, and you know, this recommendation actually comes from a report published in The Lancet uh, about five years back. This was what kind of healthcare professionals do we need for the 21st century? And they looked at the medical education, uh, education through the last 100 years. And they found that there were three stages through which medical education has evolved. The very first 20, 30 years were the science-based curriculum, where pathology, you know, chemistry, you know, pharmacology, they were all taught in silos. Then around the 1950s, 60s, there was a transition towards the skills and competency-based curriculum. Where the, case, where the teaching was more on the basis of cases, solving real world problems, clinical cases. But then now, the problems that we face in the present era, they are much challenging problems where a doctor needs to more, know more than biomedicine. We need to be well aware of the psychosocio ecological model or the social determinants of health. We need professionals, healthcare professionals who are not just good clinicians, but who are good leaders, who are systemic thinkers, who are well versed with policy, economics. And Precisely for that reason, the medical education system has to involve all these different aspects, not just talking about what's happening inside the body, but how economics, politics, policy is actually affecting the health of a population. So once that is done at a policy level, you know, we can see the change happening. Sadly, the Medical Council of India just five years back came up with a visions document for uh, uh, transforming medical education. And what it seemed as if they are just moving one step ahead. So they are moving towards the skills and competency bit. There was absolutely no talk about you know, systemic and integrative teaching and thinking. And post that, there was a debate among different specialties of how they are not getting enough time you know, spared. So I think this is where the push needs to come from you know, at, at policy level, changing the medical education system. I have uh, one point on the grassroots innovation. Um, there are uh, two, three initiatives going on. One is um, National Innovation Foundation, you might have heard Professor Anil Gupta. There are like two lakhs ideas sitting there, right? I was there a few months back in Delhi. Um, rural Ministry has launched another initiative called Bank of Innovation and Ideas, BII. So I was there at the launch. Uh, not much has happened. So we spoke with Siddhan, tried to see how ORF could work around, you know, re reviving that. Another area on the grassroots innovation, uh, if you look at all of our discussion, it's, it's surrounding the metros, surrounding the, the I would say, a, a particular class, which is probably either coming from the abroad education-wise or coming from the metro element of it, right? So that's the original idea that Anil Gupta started this grassroots innovation. We had a honeybee network across the country to find any innovation and, and document it. So that has been done. But I took... Uh, one one person from that experiment. Like this guy has 35 inventions, three patents, an award by President of India. But he has no food to eat, right? He just lives in a 300 square feet house. Uh, just pictures of he's getting an award. So good talent, but what is lacking? He cannot speak English. So ours is the only country if you probably wear your own dress and if you speak your own language, whatever education you have, you cannot get ahead, right? But interestingly, we are 1.2 billion. Only 250 million speaks English. What happened to the rest of the 1 billion people? What can we do? So I think that's one of the investments what I have is uh, speech recognition in 14 Indian languages. So now microfinances are using this. A tribal in Gujarat can take a 500 rupee Nokia phone, do a bank transaction using that. So. So there is some innovation there. But what we have done is, I took this person from Anil Gupta team. I said, what do you, what do you want? He said, I have three patents. I have no use for it. Keep it. Do whatever you want. I need a place. I just want to keep on innovating. So that's when we've started an initiative in Madurai to promote rural entrepreneurship. So we have a name called Native Lead. So how the locals think about innovations and how do we help the ecosystem, what we're talking about, we have four parameters, uh, four pillars, what we call. One is enable, nurture, incubate, and invest. So the enable part, we identified 20 colleges down rural area. These guys cannot speak a word of English. Engineers, doctors, all of that, right? Go 
kind of tell them about finding the local problems, start solving it, we will bring the ecosystem to you. Because they, they may be technically fantastic, but they cannot come and talk in a Thai meeting. They, can, they cannot say a word, right? So they are kind of left out. So we, I've told no English, no PowerPoint. Just pick a problem, start solving it, we will bring the ecosystem to you, right? So what we have done is we've launched the Indian Angel Network Madurai chapter, right? So I and DAS from 50 lakhs to 4 crores, but these guys want 5 lakhs to convince their parents they're going to start entrepreneurship, not go to a college. We said, okay, then we launched a small network which will invest only 5 lakhs to 25 lakhs. So I've told that that money has to come from local, right? We are not going to go for the government. We are not going to go to Delhi, any government or anybody else to bring the fund because we are a $2 trillion economy. Every pocket has a wealth. So we, I, it took like two years for me to meet every HNI in this area. We got them now finally 45 investors. So I've told, okay, this is the invention coming from here. You support because in a network, he cannot come and speak in English. He's going to be Tamil. So all you guys should be Tamil so that he can freely talk to you in the local language, then you will fund him. So now we have around two, three investments happening. The guys who are picking up the local problem, solving it. Because I've told them you never need to catch a plane because Tamil Nadu alone is a six crore people, which is three Malaysias put together. Why he has to go anywhere else, right? So that's the beauty that we have from the grassroots innovation side, every part of it, you know, if you're able to do, move this innovation beyond sorry, beyond IIT, IIMs, to everywhere across the country, the, because there is a lot out there. They're not able to come out. So we need to figure out you know, more of this. I was really impressed because we launched in Madurai. I got a call from Trichy to launch it. Somebody from Bhuvaneshwar is calling us. I said, what do you have done here? We want to do it. So this is where probably some of you could you know, figure out a way to mobilize more of these in the rural hubs, in the hubs, put the entire ecosystem. Every week, I, I take somebody there. There was a United Seed Fund, US, he used to run Microsoft Windows. I took him there to Madurai. We launched a Hello Tomorrow from French government, right? There is this, you know, uh, there is another group is coming from uh, IMA, spend a week there telling about how to start, write a business plan. So I've told, I will bring the ecosystem to you. You don't need to go there. So that's where the grassroots innovation part. I want to, sorry. The government side, sorry, on the government side, quickly one is um, uh, taking the cue from what he was mentioning is three things what government is kind of confusing the healthcare space, right? One is they're the provider, they're the regulator, they're insurers as well. They need to pick one so that we can figure out. Because any investment we do on primary healthcare, I always as a dilemma that how long this guy will survive, right? Because we are creating a solution for a government lack of ability, right? So is it a 10 year before the PhDs will be operational, then all my investment should shut down, right? Or is there an element that government will adopt? An example is 1298 investment in Mumbai, it's ambulance, you might have known. So it's a great example that she's 26 when she started, and she has 900 ambulances now, she was the first one to respond to the Mumbai incident. Ministers saw that, three state governments outsourced their 20 million dollar, no tender, no running behind ministers, right? She's managing three states, 108. So is that an element? So government entrepreneurs probably could get in, solve a problem, scale it, then can government pick it up? So is that that element? Or I will be the provider, you do the rest of it. So that is something probably or could figure out how we can lobby, create a you know, kind of direction for the government, just pick one so that rest can be filled by someone else. slides, I had shown two devices, these are micro devices, micro electromechanical devices, which we are making in IIT Bombay Fab or ISC Bombay Fab. These are essentially student uh, nano fabrication facilities. Uh, with reference to this session on uh, Make in India, 
scaling up because today I can make hundred twenty thousand, but uh, potentially the product has uh, I mean it has a potential that it can go go into millions and therefore we need a facility where these things can be fabricated in hundreds thousands and millions. Now I will just like to take uh, you back to a few decades into history, that is the mid 80s, when I guess uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi ji was the Prime Minister and the electronics thing started coming and the PC was introduced. Uh, there was also a move towards telecommunication. At that point of time, that was a very good time for India to get into CMOS fabrication, that is uh, whatever the chips that go into this phone and uh, uh, you know those processors or those memories and everything. That was one time where India could have actually got into that, but we did not get in. Now it's too late, so, uh, so this is one thing. During those days, uh, Taiwan, which was again a third world country in those days, actually decided that they will get into this business of contract manufacturing. So someone does the design, but it is manufactured in Taiwan. And they had a public sector undertaking just like us, maybe SCL, something semiconductor complex limited type, that was called as Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. So this company, they, s they decided that they will do the contract manufacturing in this company. They got a very good fellow working, a Taiwanese fellow in the US working in Texas Instruments, uh, Morris Chang. And he was given this mandate to make or to convert this company into a contract manufacturing company. Uh, eventually, you know, they started slowly, but they got funding from a lot of others like NEC, Philips, and all the, all the big, uh, even Intel also gets things fabricated from them. So today this company has grown into uh, a big mammoth, gorilla, you, uh, you, uh, you know, you can call them. So out of the contract manufacturing that is done, they control 53% of the market. Their next competitor is at 9%, which is UMC. They have, uh, you know, fab facilities, uh, uh, in most cases opposite each other. So what my point is, now we have lost the semiconductor CMOS race, definitely. We are, you know, 30 years, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have lost that. Uh, I think two or three years back, government stated that they want to have fabs in India. Uh, they also sanctioned two fabs with the investment of, I believe, something like 50 or 60,000 crores. These were to come in, uh, one was going to come in Delhi by the Jai Prakash group and other by uh, HSMC and ST Microelectronics and Prantij Gujarat. That hasn't taken off, it's more than a year now. Uh, and they say that, you know, uh, they don't have the money. ST Microelectronics is not doing well, neither is JP doing well. So whatever share they can put in is not possible. Anyway, it would have been a dud project, that is my gut feel, because CMOS race we had lost. The other thing was, uh, uh, after CMOS, you have the solar. So can you make all those solar cells in India? Unfortunately, China is again a very big gorilla and they will definitely kill us. So there is no chance of India getting into the solar panel manufacturing business. It's, you know, you can even, uh, you know, any big company in India will not be able to do that. Now, what is the opportunity space? So I believe that MEMS is one. That is microelectromechanical systems that we make. And the primary reason why it should be one is because it's uh, very compartmentalized. It's not like a chip you make, you know, it goes into every phone or a memory which goes into every phone or a solar panel which goes into every phone. So you have accelerometers, you have printer, uh, inkjet printer heads, you have microphones uh, which are silicon based, you have biosensors that I am talking of, you have micro heaters that again I am talking of. So all these things are possible. The primary reason is that MEMS doesn't require huge fabs, uh, not the 12 inch or the 18 inch varieties, even the eight inch uh, variety can do. And my belief is that we do have fabs in India like SC or Sitar or BHEL, uh, sorry, BEL in Bangalore. Uh, so can, uh, you know, through this policy statements or through this think tank, can we suggest to the government that let us get into contract manufacturing, but not into the CMOS or the solar cell variety, but into MEMS, into sensors. Because 10, 15 years down the line, when the internet of things is going to be the big business, as they call it, then we are in place. You know, we would have done a homework and we are there in place. I think it is very appropriate that we uh, do not become the me tool. Yeah. It's important that uh, someone who has strategic vision uh, chooses that this is what I want to do because this might 
not be the best thing to do right now, yeah. but this will be the future. Devices, if I don't get it fabricated in India in millions, I need to get it done from Taiwan sure. or from the or from the US or from some European country or Malaysia. But if we have this uh, thing done in India and it is possible, so people are racing, and uh, you know uh, this is the time really we can put the whole thing in. India. So, like you said, you talked about sensors, and I'm a Type One diabetic. I use what is called a CGMS, Continuous Blood Glucose Monitoring System, and I pay 3,500 for one sensor. I get five boxes, five sensors in a box, 16,000 rupees. Now, to be able to monitor your sugars is, is crucial for a diabetic, especially a type 1. And for them not to know their sugars is, is, is life and death, especially if you get a low blood sugar, which I'm, the reason I got this is because I used to have these terrible, terrible low blood sugars. And when, when Mr. Nitin talks about being able to predict and address the needs, so imagine being able to manufacture these sensors in India, being able to manufacture you know, the insulin pumps in India, the pacemakers in India. Imagine the life-changing difference it will make in the lives of you know, so many Indians who are affected by problems uh, like heart disease and, and diabetes. You know, we need to address problems based on the need. And, support it with manufacturing uh, and get into the area of manufacturing based on what the problems are for today. So that's just something I wanted to add uh, when we talk about sensors and manufacturing. Uh, I just uh, want to make a couple of points. One is, is make sure that we get centralized against what uh, Nitin was saying. Uh, we try to make pacemakers Medtron, uh, uh, pace, we try to make pacemakers Medtronic, Guidant, and all sorts of other uh, gorillas will smash you. Okay, so the, I mean the thing is that we, when we are talking about, I mean this is about medical innovation here. I mean, so we, I think we have somehow moved a little bit away from there. We are talking very generalities and not talking about the medical space anymore. Uh, medical, that, that also we need to identify Indian problems, have Indian solutions for the problems. If there is a, if it's a global problem, most probably a solution like that exists, which might be costly, but the, uh, like stents, uh, when the stents were being sold for a very high price, now in India they have started making a little bit of stents, so the price has dropped, which is good, but the price drop is for driving these guys out of the market, and then the prices will go up again. So, I mean, so there's a, uh, there's a cycle of that thing, it will go, go on and on. We have to recognize what are problems in India and solve those problems using our innovative skills. That is what we need to talk about and where government policies can aid and government policies can impede and all these things. That should come from that point of view of the medical innovation space. Absolutely. Uh, just just uh, for example, whenever India has actually put its heart and soul behind a medical innovation, be it the intraocular lens or be it a heart valve, it has actually dramatically cut down costs and it has not become a cheap product. It's a very high quality product. And it has been uh, reverse imported to even the uh, quality sensitive United States of America or in the Europe. And I think uh, I'd like to ask all of you is, there are now at least baby steps or big steps towards innovation. How are we ensuring that the government puts it foot down and says, let's adopt this? The, Quite frankly, if you are a medtech startup and uh, if you come up with a device which will either go into private or the public healthcare system, you have not actually faced trouble for fundraising. You have not faced enough trouble for testing because once you realize you have to sell, there is a tendering process. And tender is written at times to the specs of a gorilla which you cannot meet because it was written for a specific device. Tenders are not written for problems. Tenders are written for pre-conceived, pre-decided products that might be sold. And uh, probably we can discuss that on how can we increase adapt, uh, adoption of the low-cost innovations uh, in our public health system. So I just want to table four things from, again, the, the discussions. There are four critical issues that India has, and I think it's a very valid point uh, you brought up. 
the first problem is distribution. We are such a vast country. We are several times Europe. We are a very disparate nation. What works in Tamil Nadu will not necessarily work in Andhra. What works in South Bombay will not work in North Bombay. So very, very diverse. Third is we are a very price sensitive market and we can't get away from that. And the fourth is access. You know, how does somebody sitting in a village in, in Tirunelveli get access to high quality um, solutions? Now, if, if you put these as India specific problems, there are some realities that are rapidly changing the world. The first reality is smartphones. India today has 150 million smartphones. In the next five years, it's going to be 650 million smartphones. Two, cloud has come and changed everything. I mean, a company like SAP is on its knees because Cloudera and Hadoop came and changed the rules of the game as far as they're concerned. And, and the third is India has a big advantage of volumes. You know, we were bringing in a, a healthcare device company. The guy, want, we, we got them to you, Doc. He wanted to $5,000 for a device. And we told him $800, he fell off his feet. He said, what's wrong with you? And we took him to 112 owners of hospitals, from our Devi Shetty to our uh, uh, Trehan. They all said, this price is not going to work in India. They said, we can only bring it down to $2,000. So we immediately came up with a solution. Go tie up with ICIC and do an EMI scheme. So there are problems, there are solutions. Expecting the government to try and address these, I think, is being fairly utopian in our approach. And again, one of you mentioned that you know a good idea, the government will follow. Like in your case, um, um, Naga, you, you mentioned uh, the guy in, uh, in or one night. They'll follow. And, and that's what I'd like to table. Is it asking for too much from the government uh, to, to actually you know, catalyze the, the medical innovation ecosystem? Or should we do it on our own and maybe government just get restricted to policy? And maybe uh, divert out of the 20,000 crores they put for startups, put 100 crores for something like this in association with, a, with an IIC or, a, or an IIT. I want government not to take any policy also. <laughs> <laughs> the custom duty is levied to protect the local manufacturer. Is that clear? In Pet City, there is no local player. In CT, MRI, truly no local manufacturing. Forget it, the tuberculosis, there is no lo lo local manufacturer. The guys are charging 35% custom duty. Please don't take any policy. <laughs> Government taking policies is detrimental to healthcare. <laughs> the second one is somebody said, we cannot beat China in uh, that, uh, what is that, uh, solar po power chips, right? Now, don't try to beat someone who is already cheapest on this earth. Do you need thousands of human needs? Maybe millions of human needs? Now doc, talk to Kuruvilla the way in which he brought him also to me and his $5,000. I was feeling amazed. It should not be more than $50. If they said they had asked for $300 or $500, he is decent. I would have asked for $100. All innovators should find out why that cost $5,000? It's after all, 4 kilos, 5 kilos, 2 kilos gadget. Even gold doesn't cost that much. <laughs> so we must analyze what to make and what not to make. And don't make blindly whatever you like. Point number three. So far, in medical, at that time I'm talking about diagnostic industry, chemistry was dictating. Going forward, physics will dictate. I've seen people putting some stains, uh, using some uh, seed solutions to find out the CBC and the various blood cell counts. Today, there is a camera. And the camera says, clear counts. Which means, even that 20 rupees of seed fluid now is going away. Mind you, physics is no consumption. And plenty of things are going to come in physics. I want all innovators to look and chase physics innovations. Whatever we have smartphone is physics innovation, not a chemistry innovation. Chemistry is not no more making sense for those who want to build value very fast and uh, sell, it to, <laughs> sell it to GE. 
don't decide what you should manufacture because of you studied somewhere in a newspaper or some, uh, um, you know, get together like this. Get to the market and find out actually what market needs. Find out, I, I said one man to find out uh, real estate in Cochin because I wanted to start a center there. He told me, sir, per square feet they are charging 500 rupees. Even Nariman Point is only 300 rupees. So what do you do? You get one, one acre land there. So that I can manufacture uh, uh, real estate and I can lease it. Mind you, whenever you purchase, or whenever you plan to purchase, or whenever somebody comes to sell you something, you will see a product. And I want you to make that product because that has been obnoxiously priced and you have room to play and don't go and play a commodity where Chinese have already played adequately. <laughs> the next point, don't manufacture always. And if you manufacture, you don't sell it yourself. Because manufacturing is a different kind of a game. Branding and marketing and reaching to an end user is a different kind of game. In my business, in laboratory business, if I could manage it big, it's only because I vertically split that business into procuring and processing. I don't do procuring. I only do processing. Amazing system. Wonderful balance sheet. Very lean management. And every investor is interested. So keep in your mind that you have to be intelligent enough to avoid unnecessary liabilities in the business process. The last point. I want all of you to understand how to calculate the cost of a material. Nowadays, if you take interview of a candidate, I find out whether he understands the costs. Any entrepreneur can become successful only if he understands the costs. Very often for services, there is a, no way of assessing correct cost, but in case of a material, there is a correct, right kind of assessing the cost. I believe a good entrepreneur is the one who could understand the cost much earlier, have understood the volume cost relationship much earlier and mind you if walmart had made a business it never made a business from a client it made a business from the vendor and it is a volume business so similarly i think a lot of methodologies are there i just listed a five points i thought today i also should be heard by all of you so i took the mic <laughs> thank you very much If I may, with your permission, abuse uh, the fact that I have the mic with me. My name is Lina Vadia, and I work here at ORF. And I've been looking at higher education for more than five years. I started uh, in sometime in 2009. And in fact, in, in uh, 2000, early 2012, we brought out this report. It says it is uh, reforms in medical education to promote uh, um, accessible and affordable health care for all. So this was done at the time that MCI, you know, Ketan Desai had been jailed because of the bribes and, you know, uh, Ranjit Roy Chaudhary was head of MCI. He came, many other medical uh, experts came, the, list, the names are all here. And we put together this, this report. And one of our key recommendations was, and I think what all the discussion I've heard today and even from you, sir, is that, you know, our education is all in silos. And part of the reason is the extreme fragmentation of our education. So, you know, if we have, we have 28 million kids in higher education today, and they are being educated in 37,000 colleges and 700 universities. China does the same number in just 4,000 universities. So you just imagine what is the value of putting 30,000 kids in one university in all departments, medical, engineering, uh, you know, social sciences, everything in one place. That's the benefit that we have lost, actually. So, you know, we had looked at medical education and we had sort of made a lot of recommendations on skilling and, you know, sort of finding hybrid between medicine and engineering. Today's topic is about the hybrid between medicine and engineering. And uh, somehow it didn't go anywhere. And, it, you know, we are almost afraid to talk about medical education anymore because, you know, the F Ministry of Health and Family Welfare simply says that's our business, you stay out of it. You know, so, so that's, 
So even the healthcare workers, so it's not just the doctors. The huge opportunity in India is all the other healthcare workers. Everybody from physiotherapists to hospital attendants to everybody, everybody. Dr. Devi Shetty came and said, you know, that's a huge industry. You can find employment. Which other industry can you find employment for so many people in hospitals and in the healthcare industry? But we, we didn't have much success. I've put a few copies out there. If people are willing to read it and give us inputs, Dr. Deepesh and I are considering redoing it, this in the context of, um, uh, you know, uh, upgrading it and improving it and maybe taking it back and taking another effort with the new government in place. So the thing about advocacy is that you have to keep you have to keep fighting. You so, know? You keep, <laughs> so if you fail once, then you keep quiet, then the next minister and the next secretary comes and you try. Just one, one last minute, ma'am. So, um, so the last thing we've done, and this report is ready only as of uh, um, a week ago, is we've created a, a report on, uh, we consulted about 300, 400 academics around the country. We traveled around the country and held discussions in many places. And uh, we came out with this document, which is saying urgent reforms in science and technology education. We didn't call out medical specially. We've just said science and technology education. And this is being signed by, it's been signed by everybody who attended the conclaves, but we, we're looking for support from all of you. We intend to take this to the prime minister, ask for a, an appointment to see him. Because, and why Prime Minister? Because it's not just HRD or Health Ministry that's engaged in education. There's nearly 18 ministries engaged in education. So, you know, whether it is tribal affairs or rural development or women, everybody's engaged in education. So we want to make a pitch for doing exactly what you have all been pointing out today that, you know, let the boundaries melt a little bit and that calls for autonomy, it calls for various kinds of reforms, and I've heard many people mention that ORF must lobby, and we are willing to lobby. So please do read, there are copies again outside. If some of you would like to read and give us inputs, then we'd be very glad to. Sorry, I apologize for taking your time, but. Oh, uh, can I just say one point? Yeah, that, no. That, that, that actually worked very well. Uh, actually, uh, actually, what? No, but what I'm saying is, look, we have to standardize our medical medical education. Standardize all the states. If you go to see if a candidate comes from South India, he has a better standard than somebody coming from Bihar. Now, see, that's what America has achieved. They have standardized the medical education in all the states. So whenever we were taking any fellows or students, we, the, there was a, a similar standardization. Now from Bombay Hospital, when I get students, there are some students who are good, some students not good. It's not their fault. They all are intelligent. It's the education. And I think that's where we have to lay stress on, not on what. And you know, we can use your technology. Like if I'm good at something, I can put my studies in thing and be taught to everybody. So I think what, we, what even the government would like is, Use, using of technology, and it's like basic sciences which we can teach through technology. Skills which people have to learn with the patients, right? But uh, basic science, anatomy, physiology, or even our history taking or something like that which, is, which needs repeated things has to be used by technology. We don't have teachers nowadays. We don't have, uh, we have students but no teachers. That's the sad part. I, when I was a student, yeah. So that you think that's I, what is important. I, I, I just, sorry, I, 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 I consider myself an academic, and hence I play in the space. I'm, I'm not a good academic, but anyway, let's put one thing. I have a fear of government. Government brings bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, bureaucracy speaks beautiful English, and they drown problems in oceans of information. So. I'm, I'm not, I mean, uh, you know, I had this uh, issue when, uh, Doc, you said, you know, the problem is doctors. Because I teach in an engineering college. The problem is not doctors, the problem is throughout. Within the engineering college, electrical engineering will not look at chemical engineering, chemical engineering will not look at wiring, but whatever. The point is that the outliers who think across the field are generally snuffed out. So actually what you're looking at basically is a system where these kind of people are encouraged or maybe create a zone 
where these kind of people find sustenance. You know, we have to go, like you have these uh, smoke uh, chambers in airports. Apparently in Indonesia, you have chambers where you can breathe fresh air. So, <laughs> so maybe we need uh, a kind of a chamber where you can breathe fresh air, where you can meet with like-minded people, you know. Uh, maybe we don't need to complicate things. Uh, somehow I'm scared, you know, to go to prime minister for everything. It's like school, you go to principal for everything. I mean, if we start something good, what is he going to do? He's not going to, and who knows how long he's going to be there. Have you seen the legal system? Yeah. Uh, a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, culturally, historically, um, uh, even uh, culturally, we don't have orchestra, do we? We don't have orchestra. We have single singers. Or, so we c that is in the DNA. We cannot work together. Sorry, Indians. I mean, we have not been trained culturally. Okay. So unless we have have good orchestra, nothing happens. So at the end of it, I mean the U.S. and all that, uh, there's uh, one or two soprano singers here and there, but um, uh, 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 there is more of orchestra than anything else. Uh, more, more. Huh? So that's what we believe governments can contribute. Coming back to, I think Viswas and the other friends have created a health entrepreneurs forum. I think it makes some sense. So far, the entrepreneurship is in the ecosystem where health was not having a focus. I wish they all make it big. Already, I attended two of their events. There were uh, 50 to 100 people. It makes sense for uh, people who are involved in health, interested in health, and engaged in health to come together and uh, use that platform. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to spend next, all of us to spend next 10 minutes. Uh, there was something that you said about uh, like us who, who can become bigger and then have to contribute to CSR. Uh, 
we, might, we can talk about how we can utilize the CSR funds. And uh, as much as I understand, it's very complicated. And if I want, and I have tried personally, to take CSR money from Medtronic, other Gurifa, they want to give it. We want to take it, but they cannot give it because the regulations are, you can give it only in a certain <coughs> way. There has to be an outcome. Uh, maybe we could uh, wrap our minds around the CSR and the money and what can the ORF uh, suggest to the government on going about G. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, right. So, the ORF is, uh, is, is uh, creating this document. And, uh, there is a G also. And there is a G in the gorilla. When it comes to CSR, I thought I must uh, make a point. This country has got roughly around 30 crores of diabetic patients, probably 10 crores screened and confirmed, remaining probably not known. Maybe 30 is a bit high, could be 25 or 20, but it is somewhere between 20 and 25 crore potential diabetic, the different stages are there. On the other side, you have got not less than 25, 20, 000, 20 crore unemployed and unemployed graduates. Each diabetic test, I bet it doesn't cost more than 5 rupees per strip and I can give it even at 4 rupees. So it only costs 4 rupees to find out a diabetic man whether he is diabetic or not. I have analyzed it uh, works out to around 500 crores of expenditure for government of India. Mind you, if it is done. Literally speaking, half of the healthcare burden of the country for the next 20 30 years is taken care of. Easiest, cheapest, doable, no technology block, it's just a matter of logistics. If at all anything is the highest priority, it is this. This is my personal opinion. I want all of you to think, and probably the communication going to different forums should tell. It needs clarity. No diabetic man knows that he is diabetic. I was not knowing, though I have been running the biggest laboratory in the country, <laughs> teaching to the every guy on this earth about what is preventive care. And on fine day, I was sitting in front of a doctor and finished drinking two, three bottles of water. He told he could be diabetic. When I studied my blood sugar, it was 400. If it can happen to me, please keep it in mind that the country is facing a huge calamity, solvable, and it gives rise to solutions if diagnosed. So this is my simple point I want to make. So if I can jump in about CSR. Ashish, use, use the mic. Oh, is there a mic? Ask, ask. Your voice is soft. So I remember in 2013 when the CSR bill came out, in the social sector there was a lot of sort of excitement about the amount of money and the estimate was about 20,000 crores in um, CSR money would come in and this year only about a thousand crores of that has actually come in and a lot of it is because of a regulatory uncertainty about what CSR activities are, what is allowed under CSR, what is considered CSR but a lot of this is also because of companies themselves are trying to figure out their own internal CSR systems and processes. So at DASA we talk to a lot of companies about their CSR and what they should do and normally sales cycles last for anywhere between a year to a year and a half, right? And also a lot of companies do not have, the companies that have never done CSR before do not have someone specifically looking after CSR. So it will generally be the person doing marketing or corporate communications would sort of be handed the portfolio on the side and be doing it whenever he or she has the time. So the problem with CSR is it will take a few years, we figure, for companies to understand what their internal CSR priority should be, uh, to understand with their legal departments what they are comfortable to giving, not to giving. Until that time, for most CSR activities, it's very essential that people who bring CSR proposals know what they want to do, what impact they want to achieve, and more importantly, how they would measure it. And once this is in place, it's very easy for companies to then say, okay, we have this outcome, it's, we can see the money going and we can see what our money is doing. So make sure whenever there is a CSR proposal and this is the feedback that we get, 
you know what outcomes you're going to achieve with that money and more importantly how you're going to have a believable system of trying to measure it. Yeah. yeah, so there are about 10 uh, activities under Schedule 7 which just got changed recently with an amendment came. So these notifications keep happening. Uh, Correction, which are very important from the age of zero to five, which, and I mean, which um, you, I know you don't like government, which can be done by the government because that's where they're doing. The, we have a raster, this no, like what RBSK, RBSK which is they're already seeing, pay, examining the uh, students and everything, and that is more scary than any diabetes, AIDS, or anything put together. I wanted to add one more point uh, with respect to the diabetes uh, you know scenario that we talked about uh, what i'm noticing is that uh, <coughs> and i've been to many other conferences similar to these and roundtable discussions uh, one company for example says that they are talking about drugs that a diabetic diabetic person can take and can extend good life for 20 years uh, wonderful the fact of the matter still remains he's taking that medicine every day and if he misses it one day then it's it's not going to be fun for him or for anybody else around him the uh, the issue therefore is keeping on talking about you know that we have to detect yes we have to detect and that's that's one of the big things but the training and the education that needs to go which basically says after detection what is the advantage not just taking medicine but there is every tool out there which will tell you what you are going to be most prone to. You are going to be most prone to blindness, amputation, heart disease, which one is it? So the point is just telling them that they have, th this is one step. The next step is to make sure, and this is not something that we have to reinvent or, or, uh, or innovate. It is out there. That education never goes to people. Whereas we talk about how 20 years more of your life can be you know, fun with the diabetes. Uh, that's, that's the mindset. I, I was telling John today that the, the planning commission's five-year plan, the 12th one came out recently. In there, I can point out to you, they talk about early detection of diabetes. They talk about early detection of chronic diseases. Where is the education? We are shouting, shouting, shouting all the time. We all know that once you detect, it's too late. Where is this going? Who is responsible to actually tell them that detection is not going to be the only solution? There are other things that you have to do. You have to detect for people to help them 
lead a better life, but you'll also have to go through the process of really training them to tell you that detection is not enough. You got to do things ahead of detection. We said, no, we're creating a fertilizer. I don't want a chemical. Right? Just go back to the old way of how they clean the toilets. So this is where, you know, the, there has to be a uh, long-term thinking needs to be happening. I think earlier this morning, we can mention about just merely copying a US idea is not going to help us. How we can look at, learn from the mistakes. And uh, we can probably say that many people never had a landing. We went to mobile. There's opportunities there in front of us. India has the next 20 years to do the things the way we want it. And all of in the room can make that happen. So if you look at each problem around us, finding out a sustainable solutions, not just merely copying a US idea, just put it out there in a different way, it's not gonna work. An example is today, California is banning glass buildings. Because very highly energy inefficient to maintain a glass building. But look at all the construction around us. 
So now US is forming up a lead, a lead, you know, lead, you know, the standards to for energy. Every house in our village is a lead 1000 certified, right? But what are we doing? We are just converting into a glass building, then you go apply for a lead in the certification and then you prove yourself you are green. So similarly we have a great opportunity in front of us with these problems around us. We have just 20 years. You know? After that problem will get solved, either we will copy US or we will become another some country or whatever it is. Right? So that is the beauty that we have in front of us. I am glad a lot of younger generation also in this room, which is really a uh, hard thing to see. They are thinking in the right direction, but let's keep in mind that just not copy what's happening on there. So medical medical innovation put doctors and engineers together and let's see what happens. Actually, really put that together. So the fear of loss is what, and there are only two kinds of people. One who overestimates the risk, another who underestimates the risks. So I am of that opinion, any organization today, if it is successful, it is because of three words which were not existing before 1980. One is IT, information technology. Second is HR. The third one is logistics. I think these three things are blended intelligently. That organization would have a great, I would say, prosperity. Simplify. Frugality. Leanness. Now he will continue. Thank you. Uh, as an entrepreneur, what I'd really like to say is uh, that, you know, we do not need policy or regulation to succeed. We will succeed in spite of it. But the regular constant change, which is unpredictable, really harms us and really harms other people who want to invest in our country and do something. 
So we really request that once you make policy, you know, be sure of what you're doing and do not create changes in three months, four months, and six months again. <laughs> That's one thing I'd like to say. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say uh, on failure is that uh, f a person fails uh, when he stopped trying. So there is always one more try. Uh, and that's how a person should go about in his life. Thank you. Um, I would like to speak from our experience uh, from interacting with several healthcare entrepreneurs from India and abroad. What we have seen is that these healthcare entrepreneurs are not able to scale technology or service models in India. Most of them, most of the young uh, entrepreneurs we've met from IIT Madras, from, from Pune and several other colleges, They've built technologies, but not able to scale. We see a mismatch between what they're trying to build and what is required in the society by the doctors, by the healthcare providers, by the several other ecosystem players. So there is definitely a need for, the, for a platform where they can validate their ideas and technologies and then take it to market. The way, way Stanford India Biodesign is doing is that they're interacting first in the market and then developing solutions. So uh, a healthy step towards that can be building that platform and uh, where, where all ecosystem players can communicate and interact and validate the ideas to, take, uh, to drive innovation in the country. I would just like to take a step back and uh, probably reintroduce Ayurveda and just re-educate all of us in India going back to our roots about what Ayurveda has and just simple steps just to make a Swasth Bharat. So I just, uh, uh, you know, continue with most of our colleagues who are talking about innovation. So innovation at work is what we do at GE. So uh, we have the state of art equipment available, the healthcare equipment which we have. And uh, let's not lose hope. I think uh, many of us were talking about government. So uh, it's not that new now, but uh, let's, uh, there was a policy paralysis for a long time, and uh, let's see that uh, uh, we can have some uh, good regulations and policies passed in uh, times to come. Uh, and uh, let's think positive. Thanks. Well, uh, I will speak only about my pet subject, uh, which is that uh, in the <laughs> India, India should get into contract manufacturing, use its already available nanofabrication facilities in uh, say BEL or SEL Chandigarh or the other uh, places where it has built, get into contract manufacturing of MEMS, bio MEMS and microsensor devices and not actually chase the dreams of making uh, CMOS chips or memories or even solar cells because that is not viable. Something is viable, we should chase that. Thank you. Hello. It was a great evening over here, and uh, we really, uh, I really could understand a lot of things which uh, I wouldn't think about. It's like what the uh, mind doesn't know, the eyes don't see. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a clinician, a pure hardcore clinician, and I would be doing surgeries, and I will be doing, I will be seeing patients. Uh, if I'm talking about innovating, it's about innovating in my technique, in my, the way I work. But if you're talking about being an entrepreneur, I would not think about it as such as a clinician. But yes, now I know that it's very important and uh, it is very important for any clinician to think in a different way. It's a way uh, which I would say that most of the clinicians don't think in this particular way. They would always think in terms of patients and how you're going to do the best for him, her, whatsoever. But to think of that bigger perspective is the need of the hour. I would say integration of services on and that also services in all spheres of life are very important. Like what the IITNs are doing, we need to integrate with them in a different way, in an easier way, as a platform which is easier, something like cloud-based service or something which will, by which I know that what you guys are doing and so that if I'm doing something which is related to that, I can always come and talk to you and then we can do something about it. So the ease with which I would collaborate with uh, uh, other institutes which are under the same university, if that can, something can be done for that, if uh, it can be more made more easier, then uh, India would go ahead. And I think the future holds a really big thing for us. Thank you. A uh, lot of healthcare challenges that we face today, you know, are not easy. They're difficult, they're wicked challenges, and they cannot be solved by doctors alone or for that matter, entrepreneurs or engineers. 
but it requires systemic, holistic, integrative, and imaginative thinking, for which we need you know people from different backgrounds, doctors, engineers, entrepreneurs, scientists, to come together, collaborate, and you know, apply the collective intelligence to try to solve these problems. And uh, uh, we have seen a few models here, you know, the, bio stand, uh, the Stanford Biodesign, and also what the work that Mr. Naga mentioned about you doing in the rural areas. So very good examples of such collaborative uh, innovation. And uh, last thing I'd like to mention is that if we have to s sow the seeds of innovation in the minds of our youth, the younger generation, it has to start from the education level. Education at the university level, in the medical colleges, making sure that you know, we, don't, we encourage failure we allow our younger generation to think outside the box. And if we do that, I'm sure the future will be bright. Thanks. So what was most heartening for me to hear was that innovation and high impact was used in the same uh, breath. And it makes sense that innovation for the sake of uh, innovation is meaningless. And any innovation that we do in this country has to serve the 800 million people that are living below $2 a day. And that's the only way that it will be sustainable going forward. We cannot uh, stick to the 250 uh, English-speaking population that lives in our city. So it's essential that whenever entrepreneurs or the ecosystem is talking about innovation and talking about supporting innovation, it's essential that we understand where this 800 million is living, what are their needs, and we build it into the ecosystem so that our entrepreneurs are able to serve it in the long run. Hello, uh, I work for an incubator where we work with startups trying to come up with new products. And two biggest gaps that I see are one is risk capital, for especially for uh, biomedical innovation. Uh, there is simply a utter lack of uh, risk capital in, in India, and we have uh, if I had to resort to government funding for uh, early stage startups, and that uh, new new programs are in place, but the, even if the project is approved at a national level, they take anywhere from eight months to one and a half years uh, for the funds to come to a startup, and that is a lifetime for a startup. And they, we lose patents, we uh, we lose the competitive advantage, we run out of uh, money waiting. I mean, we run out of we can't we lose employees waiting for that money to come in. So that's one big gap that I hope to see addressed. Second is more industry-academy interaction. Um, what happens in, in, in academic institution may not be relevant uh, to the real world. More dialogue can help. And industry can also hope to uh, get their strategic needs addressed by, in, uh, by in engaging in a dialogue that there's mutual understanding of needs and processes and uh, outcomes at a broad level, then it can be very beneficial to uh, encourage research relevant to unmet needs in the country as well as efficient technology transfer. Thank you. Hello. Um, yesterday I was in an investor meet. Uh, one uh, one uh, investor company, they wanted to meet with me. I was in Mumbai. So uh, at the end of the discussion, what they told me was, Suvashish, you should really go to the US, take your idea there, let it flourish, then bring it back to India. And I'm thinking, I left the US, I'm a US citizen, to come here and do what I wanted to do because India is the diabetes capital of the world, chronic disease capital of the world. Now, this is the mindset which you just now talked about, no risk appetite. They're all waiting for others to take the first move. And if they do, then believe me, an avalanche of money is going to come in when I don't need them. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make over here is, Keep at it, and I, being an entrepreneur, I have failed twice in doing two things. I celebrated it myself. You know, I don't care whether others celebrate it or not. But what I found out is that in this process, what I'm learning is coming from the US, where the risk appetite is so much more, that here is where the problems are, and here is where the risk should be taken, and here is where the risk taking appetite is the least, okay? Number one. Number two, talking about marriage of engineers and, and uh, medical people, doctors, all that, I couldn't find it, so I married it myself to myself in, in the sense I got I, an engineering background and I started to do work in the medicine area. 
And then I was looking for doctors who would understand numbers because that was so difficult to find until I found him. Dr. Said is an amazing guy with numbers and he's a brilliant doctor. So if you keep looking hard, you'll find it. And when you find it, as Steve Jobs says over there, you'll move mountains. And that's what we want to do. And I think we are on the right track. Thank you, Dr. Subhashi. Um, I'm, a, I'm a physician practicing, and uh, I totally see an uh, urban crowd. So I take care of the employees in Cisco. And uh, from the five, past five years, I've been doing so. Now, and uh, I've been doing this uh, more into the preventive medicine to feel like I'm, I can make an impact into the IT world and the health. It is to some extent happening. But after attending this session today, especially with what Dr. Rohini was saying, uh, the, urban, the rural areas and the, the programs which the government makes and how we uh, uh, let them happen. So I'm really, really impressed and uh, would like to contribute in those aspects also. So to take forward the preventive medicine, I happened to come across Dr. Subhashish and he was uh, in very infantile state uh, trying to do something about that. So, um, so I'm right now contributing uh, to see if from my side, I can do something to the world, which Dr. Subhashish is very eagerly and keenly doing. Uh, I would also want to add that uh, uh, since you people are making so many points, and one of you also mentioned that the number of PG seats do not match with the number of uh, MBBS seats. So there should be something about it where at least m most of the MBBS people get a PG seat and contribute better to Indian crowd. And lastly, uh, Dr. Suleiman Merchant had mentioned that Vitamin D3, which, uh, which is, a, uh, which is ra running an epidemic in India, they say 80% of Indians are vitamin D deficient. Uh, so he suggested that there should be a national, a national program where children, are, immuni uh, children are, are, are injected with at least one dose you know, at a young stage. So I, I back up, uh, or rather I back uh, Dr. Suleiman for it. Okay, just brief. Um if everything is dark, light your own candle. So if you find that there's no eco space, create one. If you don't have a doctor, find a doctor. If you don't find an engineer, I've done this successfully since 2004, and I had fun, and I would recommend that. Yeah, I think the net take home uh, from today is, one is that it's a good platform to keep interacting amongst the various stakeholders in healthcare innovation. And the main take home is that uh, you fail, and we've also had this experience over the last six years, that more downs than ups. But just keep going at it, and I think one day we shall make it big. Uh, since I'm the doctor and also academic, I think what Dr. Cha said, good low-cost health care, that should be our motto, saying that how are we going to get good low-cost health care, and that also to rural people. Uh, urban people can afford it. They pay it and they get it. How we can do it, I think that should be our motto. Whether we use technology, whether we use trained doctors, we need to do a lot of things. And I think it is a thing which we ha all have to do collectively. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank ORF for organizing this kind of a forum and bringing people from different fields on the same forum. And I think we are living in exciting times uh, when it comes to innovation in the country and uh, especially in the field of medical innovation. But my one submission to the group is that let's not forget that 800 million, as somebody suggested, who lives under two million, two dollars per day. I mean, they are the key play They are the ones who will actually decide whether whatever we are innovating will impact the country's uh, position or not. So this is one area which we no should not lose focus on, and maybe you know develop things with the with the mindset of that population. Thank you. No, I just have two things to say. If ORF is to catch the government's attention. The, you need a war cry, and like, and this government is very good at war cries, whether it's Make in India or whether it's Swachh Bharat. So taking, borrowing from Subhashi's idea, I think ORF should present a Swast Bharat uh, war cry for the government. Um, and the second thing is, please understand there is enough risk appetite. Venture firms are chasing good ideas. So if, 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 you're a, if you've got a bright idea which is relevant for India, which, which has a scalable opportunity, there's enough good money going to follow you. So all the best to the entrepreneurs. Three words. Yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, um, I'm going to just...
conclude by saying that, you know, from all your discussion, that we would like to think in India, to make in India, and to use in India. And hopefully we would like to capture all whatever you have said here in a report and, and make sure that it, it, it reaches the right people and it, is, it sees implementation, because I think that's what we finally need. Okay, so thank you uh, very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming today. Uh, round of applause to our very moderate moderator, who did an excellent job of uh, running that through, who has to now leave. Uh, just next steps forward, that's, I have to do this, is that uh, the one thing we keep hearing over and over again is facilitate, facilitate, and fuse. So that's pretty much what we're doing now. We are being a confluence point, a platform for people from all sides of the arts, doctors, engineers, uh, the ones who are also not married to each other, and the ones uh, who are entrepreneurs, startups, and pretty much everyone under the sun. And we want to take this forward. So what we're going to do now is we're going to be writing a report. And we're going to reach out to you for your input if you want to be featured in the report. And we're going to have a follow-up event on this uh, sometime down the line on, on a broader innovation platform. Uh, a little secret to share. The one thing that we had hoped coming in, and I think I told Dr. Jha this, was there was an unofficial uh, plan that we had, that despite what we did on the agenda. And that was we wanted to see sparks fly. We wanted to see people connect across borders, across uh, different cross-cultural and cross-dimensional ways of studying and ways of looking at life. And we think we've seen a lot of that. And I have a feeling that a lot of you are going to engage outside this platform, and we really encourage that. And if you'd like to do that uh, through us or if there's someone you met today that you want to be connected with later, please shoot me an email, and we'll make that happen for you. Because at the end of the day, we are just a confluence point, facilitating good things with good people. Thank you very much. You have a good evening. Bye.